Merci pour vie et bon chez nous. Nous sommes à la station télévision MTN et puis moi là avec Virgil Leonti. Nous avons nous présenté ce qui a passé en scène là pour aujourd'hui, 28 novembre l'année 2023, avec quand nous avons dit bon matin, peut-être si vous avez bon chez nous, nous avons présenté. Bon matin, c'est ce qui est comme je viens pour considérer ces motions et ces billes-là, les lois qui sont passées en cas de consulte. Ça, c'est l'autre chambre, l'autre dégoué en Parlement qui te jouent. Ça, c'est mardi avec vendredi semaine passée pour discuter ces différents sujets. Moi, j'ai oué au power là, mais je veux dire vite, moi, ma salle, ça veut dire avant de arriver. Yeah, well, we will be continuing from where we left off this morning, where we saw a couple of motions that were passed. And we expect one more motion and a couple of bills to be tabled this afternoon by the leader of government business. Now we take you over to the chambers. following motion standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by section 62.1 of the Public Finance Management Act, Cap 1501, the Act, that the Minister of Finance may, by an affirmative resolution of Parliament, borrow from a bank or other financial institution for the capital or current expenditure of government. And whereas it is further provided by section 64 of the Act, that money borrowed by the government must be paid into and form part of the consolidated fund and whereas the Minister of Finance considers it necessary to borrow an amount of US $1,203,224 the loan from the CARICOM Development Fund the fund to finance the Passius Community Water Supply Project and whereas the loan is repayable in 10 years commencing from the first day of the first due date of after the grace period of two years following the date of first disbursement. And whereas the loan is repayable in 40 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments, and whereas the loan payments commence on the 30th day of March, the 30th day of June, the 30th day of September, and the 30th day of December each year. And whereas interest is payable at a rate of 3% per annum, on the amount of the loan disbursed and outstanding. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of US $1,203,224, the loan from the CARICOM Development Bank, the fund to finance the Passias Community Water Supply Project. Be it further resolved that A, the loan is repayable in 10 years, commencing from the first due date after the grace period of two years, following the date of the first disbursement. B, the loan is repayable in 40 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments. C, the loan payments commence on the 30th day of March, the 30th day of June, and the 30th day of September, and the 30th day of, November, of December of each year. And interest is D, and interest is payable at a rate of 3% per annum on the amount of the loan disbursed and outstanding. Uh, Madam President, this is a motion that I really do welcome um, for two reasons. One, because it addresses a fundamental principle uh, that as a St. Lucian and as a member of this government that this loan actually supports and also the project that this loan is going to support 
happens to be a project in a community that is from the same district where I was born and raised, the Miku district. Mr. Uh, Madam President, this is a loan of 1.2 million. That is for a specific purpose, and that is for the Passius um, Water Development Program. And as you would know, Passius is a community in the constituency of Miku North. And not only is Passius going to be benefiting, but the entire, um, almost the entire community of Monopo um, is going to benefit. Now, only during lunch, I was having a discussion with um, colleague senators and the community of Monopo came up in a discussion, famous for a number of very good things, um, cricketers, sports, the cultural icon, um, Sesen Descartes, and many other good things. But one of the things we were not aware of is that for so many years, this community has suffered and has had issues with a regular, clean, and reliable water supply. I do not wish to go down the road of blaming anybody because it is very clear in the history of our St. Lucian politics who represent where and for how long. So I will leave that alone, but I will say, say to the, the people of our country that our government is committed to taking care of our people and making sure that, um, as uh, one member put it, one of our sustainable development goals, SDG 6, which speaks to basic um, the basic needs, the basic care of, of um, rights of humans, and one of them is clean, fresh water, is adhered to. And I think the, the MP, when he spoke to this motion, um, being a young, first-time MP, enthusiastic, and just, just justifiably so, made it very clear that he was appreciative of the initiative. He made mention of a number of communities, and I want to, at this point, Madam President, highlight the communities in Miku North that will be benefiting from this particular um, intervention. Um, as it is, the Passias community, the Loba community, Laho, which is to the left of the main road if you're coming north, um, the Pwale community, which is a sub-community in its own, um, Mamiku, where we have a very interesting tourist development, where we have a, a very good um, set of attractions, especially the, the, the flora and fauna of this country, the Monrepo Central Community, the Saint Marie, Grass Street, La Pointe, the Wen Development, which is where the primary playing field is. That's good. So I, I, I remember the, the, the leader of opposition business was talking about if I have his permission to, to say um, how they used to have to carry water from to water, water the pitch in Grosely, and I was telling him how I would have to get up at two in the morning to steal my wife's hose and go water the there is a pitch. Um, thankfully, thankfully the, the people of Monrepo will not have to do that. And they can water the wind playing field, not suggesting that they use water from the tap, but they probably can find ways to be creative. And um, perhaps even if they can't water the pitch, because I don't think the sustainable development goals will encourage that, but they can at least have drinking, fresh drinking water and use the rainwater to do, to do the, the, the pitch. Um, the, I think it is a necessary initiative, Madam President, particularly since it is facilitating um, bringing fresh water to community, communities within the constituency. Another very notable observation is that there are schools in that community. And earlier on, our debate also brought schools into focus. And this government is, is what this initiative is doing for, for us and the people, is a two-pronged um, benefit. One for the community as um, private citizens, but also for the institutions that the government is running, particularly schools. Um, in the, in the Monrepo community, I think there are at least four or five schools. Um, and if you have to include the preschools and the early learning institutions, they also stand to benefit from this initiative. And so I welcome it. I really am very happy as somebody from the Miko district. Um, I have friends and close allies in the Monrepo area. I know that um, my colleague, Senator Daniel, who is from the area, should be very happy about this. And some of, some, some of us have other links there. So I welcome this, and I look forward to the relief and the basic um, need and supply of fresh and clean um, water that is going to bring to the people of 
the Miku North, particularly the Monrepo area. And I ask for this House um, support for this very necessary um, initiative. I thank you. Senators, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of US $1,203,224, the loan, from the Caribbean Development Fund, the fund, to finance the Passions Community Water Supply Project. Be it further resolved that A, the loan is repayable in 10 years, commencing from the first due date after a grace period of two years, following the date of the first disbursement. B, the loan is repayable in 40 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments. C, the loan payments commence on the 30th day of March, the 30th day of June, the 30th day of September, and the 30th day of December of each year. And D, the interest is payable at a rate of 3% per annum on the amount of the loan disbursed and outstanding. Senator Fede. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam President, sorry. Um, Madam President, um, I want to congratulate the leader of government business and the St. Lucia Labour Party for following the very rich tradition of the United Workers Party um, in uh, buttressing improvements in the water supply for the benefit of the people of St. Lucia. Yeah. Madam President, um, not only uh, is, do I belong to a party that has um, presided over the most uh, important water project in this country, the establishment of the John Compton Dam. But just in the last five years, within the cabinet where I sat, there were one, two, three, four, five water projects um, uh, that we established. In fact, six water projects. And I want to, Madam President, um, say that this is really good for the people of St. Lucia um, to see in this instance that the St. Lucia Labour Party government would find it fitting to continue in that trend um, because it is important, Madam President, you see it is the same spirit we had when we came um, in and we recognized that there was a very troublesome project in the constituency of Denry North and um, in the same vein that the uh, leader of government business would have mentioned that we did not look at the parties and politics but what we did was we saw that look this project was important for the people of the valley mm -hmm. uh, it was the seat was held by the St. Lucia Labour Party so we moved with haste Madam President to ensure that that project was established and what we did was we brought the member of parliament Honorable Sean Edward mm -hmm. to cut the ribbon for the project yep. because we didn't really care about yep. who got the credit. Um, what we cared about was to make sure that the people of Denry North get a very sustainable means of good quality affordable water. Mm -hmm. Madam President, in my own constituency in Canaries, um, where they get the water supply from the Canaries River, and there's a catchment up the river. Um, we were very, very, very happy to have facilitated a CDB project. And I remember that this project was to enhance the Canaries water treatment facility. And we spent somewhere in the region of about um, uh, $3 million to establish this facility. Uh, what it did, Madam President, because I don't want to be I don't want to be misconstrued that I'm only focusing on the money part, but equally important is that the outcomes which this brought about was that in investing the three million, it automatically uh, improved the water, uh, the capacity of the canneries water catchment. So much so that its um, supply extended to areas such as Buta in the constituency of Sufra. The Viewfort constituencies also saw very successful um, implementation of water projects um, 
by the previous administration. And that really was crucial to the people of uh, both Viewforts, North and South, um, to make sure that they were getting um, very adequate water supply. And these two projects were bigger in scale and bigger in size and bigger in cost. Um, obviously, the population um, size was, was that much bigger than that of uh, Viewfort. I think in the case of the Viewfort South Water Project, it's also supplying parts of the library constituency as well uh, to make sure that more people in St. Lucia um, have an opportunity to get the very best water supply in the country. In the north of the country, where we don't have as much rainfall, but in the community of Labon, um, in Moshi, there was also the establishment of a water improvement project there, um, established by the MP for that area. And this project um, really did improve the lives, the livelihoods of the people of Labon, so that they um, can, you know, get rid of um, this whole tradition and long history of insufficient water supply which have really afflicted them for many, many years. Madam President, I want to get to the John Compton Dam because um, this really was the, the most fundamental, the biggest in size of all the water projects that we have done. Now, the cost of the dam was about 19 million US um, when the dam was established back in the 1990s. Madam President, before this, um, I am very, very moved when I hear some of our former leaders um, speak to the issues that confronted St. Lucia back then. And that is there were people who were, who were, who were dying from waterborne diseases um, not so long um, in our country. And this history is important to reflect upon, to show that over successive years how far we have come because the progress that we have made with the establishment of the dam, with the establishment of other water catchment facilities, um, is very, very, very instructive to the progress that we have made in our water supply in the country. Um, so the drilling of the John Compton Dam, I remember when I contemplated entering politics, that this was one of the um, pressing issues that I read about in the newspapers. It was all, always very covered in the media. And they were saying that the dam which supplies the north of the island, where about uh, over 60% of the population resides, um, and depend on the dam for its water supply, that it had maybe one third of its capacity. And in the dry season, it posed significant challenges. There were times that Wasco would actually call on the population to ration water because the dam's uh, intake was so depleted. And so drilling this dam was very crucial towards the um, enabling of the water supply in the north of the country. And when we came in, Madam President, the then Labour Party, they were charging a dredging fee. Um, but after many years of charging this dredging fee, they actually failed to do the drilling itself and dredge the dam so that we could ensure that the silt of the dam would have been out and we would have increased the intake of the John Compton Dam. Madam President, I'm happy that during the last cabinet which I served in, um, I was very happy to be part of the ribbon cutting exercise of a CDB funded project where we established, drilled, completed, and organize the John Compton Dam to elevate the, the capacity of the dam so that it can better ably supply residents of the country with its water supply. Not just residents, but a lot of businesses as well. Um, you would appreciate, Madam President, that in the Grosley area, um, a significant portion of our tourism room stock um, reside. Um, in the Castries Basin, you also have the um, cruise port sector. So St. Lucia's economy um, really depended on this significantly as much as household use for the increasing demand of water. I think more importantly though, Madam President, 
is that we have to look at the cost of water in the country. And we have to look at the cost of producing water in the country. Madam President, um, the time has now come for us to do the comprehensive analysis on whether St. Lucia can continue to abandon the fact that we are an island surrounded by a massive body of water from the ocean. And what role can desalination plants play in our quest to reduce the production cost of water, which will ultimately allow us, if we're able to produce the water a lot cheaper uh, for a, a metric gallon, how much better are we going to be able to supply the citizens of this country at a cheaper cost, which is what we all should be aiming to do, Madam President, in a manner. So I think that that, that conversation um, did preoccupy our cabinet. Um, we certainly didn't spend enough time to be able to um, get all of this organized in a, in a, in a manner, but certainly it's a discussion that we had um, reflected upon and give serious consideration to. I know in other countries, they rely very much. They don't have as many mountains and rivers as we do. And so uh, they don't have the luxury of catchments. And they have actually resorted to the whole uh, method of desalination plants. And we have to now ask ourselves whether getting our water intake from the oceans and processing it um, with desal plants, whether that is a more reliable um, source of water given the fact that um, we have the whole business of climate change that's affecting our country and the high levels of silt which um, is undermining all of our water catchments all over St. Lucia. Um, the John Compton Dam, we removed millions of gallons of silt and whether now that we can afford to continue the cost of um, removing the silt and, and constantly desilting whether the time has now come for us to resort to the ocean so madam president with these comments um, i want to congratulate the government for continuing this tradition of um, working assiduously although this is the first water project i've seen um, in their tenure, but I'm looking forward to seeing them doing much, much more so that we can bring about um, an elevated level of water supply to the people of St. Lucia in all corners of the country. Thank you very much. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the Opposition Leader of, of Opposition Business for his intervention. Um, interestingly, when the opposition cannot beat up on, the, on, a, on an issue, they, they try to own it. It's a formula that we're familiar with, so you can't beat it up. You can't come here and say that we shouldn't bring water to Monopo. You can't come here and say that the people of Mikunos don't deserve to get their water supply augmented to improve. So you come here and you spend out of your 10 minutes, 8 minutes, Madam President, or so, talking about the John Compton Dam. You'd swear that this, um, this motion is to borrow money to desilt the John Compton Dam. Madam President, this motion is about borrowing money to bring water, reliable water, to the people of Miku North. That's what it is. So the whole long lecture about we did this and we did that and tradition being followed, I don't know what real, I, I was, tempted to, to stand, but I said, no, let it go ahead. Um, so just to remind our listeners that this, this bill, this uh, motion is to borrow one, about $1.2 million to secure a better and more reliable supply of clean water for the people of Miku North, most, most, um, most specifically the Passions area. Thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of U.S. $1,203,224, the loan, from the Caribbean Development Fund, the fund, 
to finance the Passions Community Water Supply Project. Be it further resolved that A, the loan is repayable in 10 years, commencing from the first due date after a grace period of two years, following the date of the first disbursement. B, the loan is repayable in 40 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments. C, the loan payments commence on the 30th day of March, the 30th day of June, the 30th day of September, and the 30th day of December of each year. D, the interest is payable at a rate of 3% per annum on the amount of the loan disbursed and outstanding. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say I, as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Bills, Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg to move <coughs> for present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Code of Civil Procedure Amendment. Code of Civil Procedure Amendment. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I move that the suspe for the suspension of Standing Order 49-2 to allow this bill to go through its remaining stages at the sitting. Senators, the question is that Standing Order Number 49-2 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Leader of Government Business to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Please proceed, Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, this amendment to this civil Code of Civil Procedure, um, this amendment is really Do you wish uh, to present the second reading? Sorry, yes, I think I should read it again, yeah. Madam President, I beg to move for second reading, a bill shortly entitled Civil Code of Civil Procedure Amendment. And I was saying that um, this amendment is procedural. Basically, the objective here is to improve the efficiency of the process that um, involved, involved in the obtaining a probate and really to appeal Article 10.152 of the Civil Procedure <coughs> Um, since the duties that this article, specifically mentioned there, um, purports to have collected no longer exist. And it, in clause two of the bill, it, it, it amends that article 10.15 of the code to um, remove the sub, subtitle two that requires letter of, of administration not to be handed out until a certificate in writing um, from the accountant general indicating non-objection to the grant or to a grant is produced at the register of the High Court. So this amendment, Madam President, is essentially to make that process more efficient and to, not, um, to ensure that this, is, this particular piece of um, information is obtained before um, they proceed. So I ask that this um, Senate gives it approval, give, it, give its approval to this amendment so that um, this, it can be done. Thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that the Code of Civil Procedure Amendment Bill be read a second time. Senator Fede. Um, Madam President, this is not as simple as it may appear. I know that they, it's very brief and it's very specific, but Madam President, look, a letter of administration is a very, very important document that empowers someone to be able to uh, distribute um, you know, proceeds from an estate to uh, manage the bank account on behalf of someone else um, and to settle debts is basically an administrator of uh, someone's estate and someone's uh, belongings and, and earnings. Madam President, I 
would have loved more explanation from the leader of government business. But in the absence of that explanation, I am going to assume that they are trying to remove some bureaucratic hurdles um, in the administration and in the dispensation of letters of administration. But Madam President, I think that um, doing so without a certificate in writing from the Accountant General is very important and it tells you something about that person's character that in whose name the letter of administration is being approved. And so I want to hear more from the government as it relates to um, why are you doing this? It can't just be it's a simple routine thing. There has to be an objective that is clear. Um, is it that you have gotten pressure from the legal fraternity um, that is asking you to do this because letters of administrations are very difficult to, um, to produce and to procure? But I also want to know, whatever the objective, whether it is worth taking the risk that the accountant general and, and getting the certificate from the accountant general, whether it is worth foregoing that requirement. So that's a very important question for me. Um, as I look at this um, with the naked eye, uh, I want to know why are we foregoing the, non -ob the need for a non-objection from the accountant general? Because for me in doing so, um, you can tell a lot about the, the person's own financial situation. So what if the person hasn't paid their taxes? What if the person um, has defrauded government on a number of fees and other commitments and obligations to the state? It tells you a lot about the person's character. So when you're going to um, give the person the opportunity to become or to um, be the, adm the administrator of you know, properties that should be going to heirs, you want to make sure that they're going to do right by all of the creditors, they're going to do right by all of the heirs and what is entitled to them, that that is going to go to them. So for me, Madam President, I do have some concerns, but I want to hear um, the clearer objectives outlined um, by the government. Thank you. Senator Lee. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just want to very short um, intervention with regard to this piece of legislation. Um, and unfortunately, I lack the rhetorical flair of Senator Daniel, but this rather short piece of legislation has a very deep history, a very deep story, one of severe frustration for a lot of people. Over 20 years ago, the death duties, which were the taxes paid on estates of persons who had been deceased, um, in the wisdom of the government at the time, was repealed. However, this certificate of non-objection, which went hand in hand with that payment of the death duties, for some reason, was not repealed. So what you had happening year after year after year was persons who were applying, and it only applied to applications for letters of administration. So if you had done a will, which is always the more advisable thing to do in any case, you had no issue. Once you passed away, your executor or your executrix, whoever you had appointed, made the application for probate on your will, and things went through very quickly. However, if unfortunately, which sadly is the case for the majority of persons who are deceased in St. Lucia, you left no will, you fell then into um, administration of your estate as happens under the civil code and the code of civil procedure. And what would happen is that persons applying um, as to be your administrator would then be faced with the challenge of obtaining the certificate of non-objection from the Inland Revenue. Well, it was dedicated, um, delegated, the responsibility, sorry, was delegated to the Inland Revenue. Initially, it wasn't much of an issue. You'd, it would be handed out as a cost because, as I said, there's no liability for death duty, so there's nothing for them to object to. But of course, bureaucrats being bureaucrats, found a way to make this thing work for them. And so you'll be constantly getting new and added requirements for the grant of the non-certificate, uh, certificate of non-objection. So first they wanted to see the application to, they wanted sorry, to examine to see whether there were any taxes due. Then they wanted to see the application for letters of administration. Then they wanted additional information. And so it was a constant back and forth, a constant delay, a constant um, aggravation for persons who are applying for letters of administration. 
when there was in fact nothing that the government could do at the time to prevent the application from going through other than withholding the certificate. And so there's been a lot of agitation by the legal um, fraternity to have this vestigial piece of legislation repealed. There is nothing that stops, because ironically, the grant of probate or the grant of letters of administration have to go to the inner revenue for registration for stamp duty in any case. So they will always see the documents. If their tax is due and owing by the estate or by the, the, the deceased, they will have an opportunity to see that and act on it. Um, the delay that was being caused by the requirement of obtaining the certificate caused severe hardship to a lot of persons. There are persons you could understand who need access to the, the, the um, estate, for example, even just to bury the deceased. You know, simple things like that were being held up um, by the need for this grant of certificates of, of um, non-objection. And as you'd understand, it's not their primary function. You make the application, it gets onto somebody's desk and remains there for a while. You kind of have to keep following up and, and hassling and, and, and agitating, sorry, for the certificate to be granted. So it's with a tremendous sigh of relief, this piece of legislation has finally come. I note, as I said, it's just two sections, but it will have significant impact on the administration of estates in St. Lucia, and by extension, the lives of ordinary St. Lucians, who oftentimes are not very wealthy, and they, they need the administration of the estates to go through so that they can move on with their lives. So I commend the government for bringing this piece of legislation finally, uh, and I hope that now some relief can come to the persons who've had their applications stuck at inner revenue for an indefinite period of time, awaiting a certificate, as I said, serve no purpose other than the fact that it was required by the law. Thank you. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the members who contributed on this bill. For a moment, I was a little bit concerned about what exactly the opposition, uh, leader of opposition business was asking me to provide information on. Because as concise as this is, it was very important that in my first statement, I did see that it was supposed to improve the efficiency with which someone can actually ob ob obtain a probate or letter of administration. I thank the independent senator, who of course is, um, is, is because of his background, has a, a, a deeper understanding of the, the real frustration that these issues can cause to an ordinary person. And I think his, his contribution perhaps would have given some more um, specific detail to clarify that. But I'm, I am very concerned that the opposition would find something wrong with a, a, a very simple, and he said it wasn't that simple, what is the suspicion that we have about the non-requirement of a letter of administration that really would serve no purpose in, in these circumstances? That if the government decides, listen, ordinary people, ordinary St. Lucians, their business, their, their being able to do, um, to administer their, their, their particular benefits and be able to, to move on after they've lost a loved one and so on, is being held up by a, a piece of red tape, if you like, an administrative burden that is not necessary. Why are we having any objection to that? This is a government that is interested in making St. Lucians, making it easier for St. Lucians to enjoy their lives here, to be able to, to move on. And I was really hoping that for once the opposition would have said, listen, we understand that the, this thing has been there for a while, but we welcome um, the move because the purpose of this is really to make the process more efficient. So I think that um, after having listened to the independent senator, who, as I said, maybe his legal background has given him more um, knowledge on these, on these issues, and that is why we must have the discussion in the Senate, so that sometimes a contribution is not always about who did what and who's better than who, but to bring some kind of clarity and explanation and, and you know, illuminate and lighten up, make things a little clearer. So. I hope that this has, has been done. I thank the members for that, and I look forward to that um, amendment bringing a lot more relief and less stress and difficulty to the average St. Lucian. The, the leader, the member over there is not an average St. Lucian, Madam President. He, he doesn't appreciate 
the, the kind of stress somebody has to go through when they leave somewhere in, 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 in bands, take three buses and have to come to, to just to be, to be told they need a letter that they don't really need. Our, our newly sworn in independence senator, I think she has connections in the band Syria. She understands as a young child how difficult it would be to take three buses to get to Castries just to find out that you have to go back and you need that thing for you be, to be able to bury your parents and some letter of administration probate that ain't, that ain't required anyway. You know, you, it's holding you back. You know the frustration that causes? And I didn't hear object to that. I mean, what is the problem? Is it we just always have to find something to oppose? This is a very simple but very necessary amendment that this government is putting to, to represent the cause of the ordinary person in this country. And then they want to come and cry about, uh, not cry, but complain and be champions of the poor and champions of the less fortunate. So that doesn't affect him. Doesn't affect him. But it affects the average person from Deriso, from um, Bans, from Bellevue, from Ansley, from Millet. It affects them. And so I welcome it, and I look forward to the benefits of the, the average people of this country. I thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that the Code of Civil Procedure Amendment Bill be read a second time. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. And not yet, not yet. An act to amend the Code of Civil Procedure Act, Cap 243 of the Revised Laws of St. Lucia, 1957. Clause 2. Amendment of Article 1015. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1, short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Honorable members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Senators, I beg to report that the Code of Civil Procedure Amendment Bill went through committee stage without amendments. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg that the report of the committee be adopted and that the bill be read a third time and passed. Senators, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the Code of Civil Procedure Amendment Bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Be it enacted by the King's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This Act may be cited as the Code of Civil Procedure Amendment Act 2023. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I beg for the first, to present for the first reading, or first reading, the bill shortly entitled Invest St. Lucia Amendment. Invest St. Lucia Amendment. Honorable Leader of Government Business. 
Madam President, I move that Standing Order 49.2 be suspended to allow this bill to go through its remaining stages at the city. Senators, the question is that Standing Order number 49.2 be suspended in order to allow Honorable Leader of Government Business to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Please proceed, Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I beg to move for a second reading of bill shortly entitled Invest St. Lucia Amendment. Uh, Madam President, I hope it will be clear that this time this, was, this is again a pretty straightforward amendment and the purpose is really to address um, changes that have taken place since the government changes. As you know, usually when there is a general election, prime ministers or ministers of finance or whoever is the leader of government may have certain configurations in their cabinet of ministers. In this case, the Labour Party government made um, its own con had its own configuration and you have a situation where the Ministry of Commerce, um, Business Development was part of, um, sorry, investment was part of Commerce and Business Development. In this configuration, the Ministry of Commerce is not part of, or the Ministry of Investment falls under the portfolio of tourism, creative industries, culture, um, information, and is not under the same uh, department or the same ministry with commerce. So you, had, you have a situation where there is need for some realignment for the linkages that need to be formed and the oversight that needs to be provided by the Ministry of Commerce on matters of investment to be properly um, dealt with and so that you will not have any disjointed activity. So this amendment really seeks to allow the Ministry of Commerce to have a senior um, official in the person of the permanent secretary to sit on the board of Invest St. Lucia um, so that the necessary oversight and the necessary information for business development that pertains to that particular ministry um, be dealt with and be properly represented. And so that will allow for more efficiency and a more seamless and improved investment climate. So really, this is necessary to really deal with the the representation that the Ministry of Commerce, which is the ministry that, that is um, responsible for business development, to, to be able to have that, that level of oversight on the board that represents the Ministry of Investment. Because as you would appreciate, Madam President, when there is this investment, it has implications for business, business development, both um, foreign and local. So that is the real purpose for this amendment, and I hope that we will find it necessary to see the, the reason why it should be done. I thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that the Invest St. Lucia Amendment Bill be read a second time. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. It appears that we saw the wisdom in that particular um, uh, need, and I thank members uh, for, for, for doing so. And I ask that the, the, the amendment be um, approved by the Senate so that the, the bill can, be can take effect. I thank you. Senators, the question is that the Invest St. Lucia Amendment Bill be read a second time. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The eyes have it. An act to amend the Invest St. Lucia Act, Cap 
We have some changes on clause two. Yes, line. Just bear with us, Senators. There are a few changes, one, two, three changes that were made at the House level, so we need to make sure we're on the same page. Clause two. Amendment of section four. Clause two stands part of the bill. And is um, before we say part of the bill. Yes. Yes, Madam President, and just drawing attention to the um, page six, clause two, amendment of section four. Um, the last line. Senator, the back page of your document, which is page six. Yeah, page six, clause, amendment of section four. Um, the last line should replace eight members with nine members because we're adding the peers. The last line? The last line, sen Senators, yeah, on Section A. Senator Japier. It says eight members on the last line of Section A. You got it, You should right? change that into nine members. Proceed. Yeah. And um, uh, D, um, the last line in D, replace commerce with business development because that is the aspect that we business. Are we on the same page? Same page six, the back page. Mm -hmm. It's D. It's when the word commerce, permanent secretary in the ministry responsible for commerce, the word commerce is replaced by business development. Are we on the same uh, page, Senators? Just a question. Um, does the word business development currently exist in the configuration of the ministry, of the said ministry of commerce? Absolutely. The ministry of commerce okay. is the ministry of commerce, industry, business development, okay. and cooperatives. So it does. Thank you, Senator. And I would think that you would know that. Senator. Close. We, Madam, Madam Clark, we proceed? Yes. Yes. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1, short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Senators, the question is that the committee rises. Is there a, okay. Um, I'm good, I'm good, yes. Senators, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as that of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Senators, I beg to report that the Invest St. Lucia Amendment Bill went through committee stage, well, without amendments on our part, that is, but amendments from the House, without amendments. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and that the bill be read a third time and passed. Senators, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the Invest St. Lucia Amendment Bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. 
As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be cited as the Invest St. Lucia Amendment Act 2023. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Climate Change. Climate Change. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I move that this bill be presented for second and for second reading at the next or subsequent sitting of the Senate. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Civil Aviation Amendment. Civil Aviation Amendment. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I move for the suspension of Standing Order 492 to allow this bill to go through its remaining stages at the sitting. Senators. The question is that standing order 492 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Leader of Government Business to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Leave is granted, please proceed Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I move for this presented, presenting for the second reading a bill shortly entitled Civil Aviation Amendment. Um, the genesis of this amendment, Madam President, is really uh, what I would consider something that is superimposed from the outside. And um, it has happened before, and sometimes it's difficult for us to deal with them, but we have to do what we have to do. Um, this bill amends the Civil Aviation Cap um, Act cap 8.07. Um, if you recall, in 2020, the ECCA, the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority, um, was deemed to be in non compliance with specific international safety um, standards. And that was, um, that was based on, or that was according to the US Federal Aviation Administration, the ECCA. And as a result, we as a country we were downgraded to category category two rating and what that means is that they are when you're downgraded to category two it means that um, certain airlines or certain um, well yeah airlines may decide not to operate within your, your destination because there are certain standards that dictate who comes to your destination and you have to meet those and so um, it meant therefore that more technical expertise would be needed um, we'll have to upgrade the inspection procedures and to improve and update our safety standards. And so, because all of these apparently from 2020 were deemed not to be in place, the, the, it is now necessary for us, uh, Mr. Deputy, to make those um, amendments so that we can become compliant and therefore hopefully regain um, uh, uh, our our higher ranking, so to speak, in that regard. So this amendment seeks to do just that, and I think we can see the benefit of not being downgraded to, to a, a category two, so that we can protect our vital aviation, um, and by, by extension, our vital tourism industry, and any other 
that is going to be affected by any restrictions placed on us um, in the area of aviation. So I look forward to that being done so that we can um, meet those standards that are required, as I said, by the ECCA. I thank you, Mr. Honourable members, the question is that the Civil Aviation Amendment Bill be read a second time. Senator Fede. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Um, just a couple comments on the bill. Um, Mr. President, I see that there has been a, a gross undermining, castration, if you will, um, of the constitutional authority that's been given to ministers of government to be the chief policy makers as it relates to various aspects of the management of the affairs of our country. Um, we go through almost all the sections, Mr. President, and we see that the powers of the minister um, as it relates to the safety and security of aviation standards um, have all been vested into the Director General of the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. Um, one aspect of this consoles me a little bit, and that it, is, it says that, um, that the minister may make regulations except, ex, exempting on such terms and conditions um, as may be specified in the regulations, a person, an aircraft of such description, a flight, an aerodrome, a facility or service from the application regulations made on the dissection. Um, so it gives the minister a little bit of um, a little bit of bite, as you will. But I have a serious problem with this. Um, I believe that depoliticizing institutions in the main, I support them, but there is still a fundamental role and a constitutional role that elected members ought to play as prescribed by the various constitutions of the Caribbean. And so I'm not blaming um, the government for this one, um, but there's just this um, extreme and constant encroaching on, on our democracies um, on the outside. It means now uh, that if, for example, an airline applies to uh, make St. Lucia a hub, that the future of that enterprise or the future of such an activity or initiative um, is dependent not on the approval of our local civil aviation authority or office, but it is incumbent upon uh, mostly ECA. So not only do they have the overarching regional responsibilities, but they have now encroached on whatever local powers the ministers may have had. Because if you look at the uh, Principal Civil Aviation, Civil, Civil Aviation Act, the, there, was a, there was a good power sharing between the minister and the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. Now, I like that old concept because what it did is that it brought together islands of the OECS um, that may, maybe we do not have the capacity on our own to establish individual civil aviation authorities like some of our CARICOM countries, like Jamaica and Trinidad, they certainly have their own, and, and Barbados to an extent. Now, what I don't like about this is that whatever local powers and responsibility that elected representative may have had um, has been totally, been, it, it's totally stripped away from them, and that's stripping away it has far-reaching repercussions for the development of airlift within a tourism-dependent economy, especially now in, a, in an instance, um, Mr. President, you've heard me on record saying how disastrous our airlift situation is in the country, where 
Um, we have lost some 13 flights a week. Chicago, Dallas, um, Miami, a whole host of these flights. And so I think that it's important, Mr. President, that we have the ability to uh, have a say, a lot more than this allows us to do, um, as it relates to the establishment of whether it's regional airlines, whether it is um, to be a subsidiary for an international carrier, um, that power has been totally stripped away from us. Um, and so I don't necessarily like this um, piece of legislation. I give you an example. In section 16, um, subsection 2, subsection 2, uh, uh, Roman numerals, 6A, where it says international commercial air transport operations, including airplanes and helicopters. Um, so the minister would have had the power to, um, without limiting to the generality of subsection 1, the d director generals may now make regulations as it relates to these commercial air transport operators, including airplanes and helicopters. Now, very, very important for a tourism-dependent economy. Very, very crucial um, that it is important that the individual countries have some level of say. You see, the democracies of um, the bigger countries, and a lot of references made here of the Chicago Convention on um, Aviation, and so this is uh, an international um, grouping of big and small countries. And so while I agree that the objective to ensure that St. Lucia meets the international standards, that that should meet, we should try as much as possible to meet those international standards so that we're taking seriously by prospective airlines that are looking to come into our country. But we must also do so in a very measured way knowing fully well that we have our own peculiar circumstances and not to be, to be broad brushed by uh, bigger countries that have their own uh, set of peculiar circumstances. And so, um, Mr. President, I understand that we are small jurisdictions with very little power in geopolitics and then the government um, hands might be forced in this regard, but I must express my displeasure uh, with certain provisions that are outlined in this piece of legislation. I thank Senator Daniel? Yes. Mr. Deputy President, I shall be, as I always promise, and I think I keep to it brief in my remarks. I think Senator Fede, despite being a former Minister of Tourism, also, of course, area in which his history and mine have intersected information and broadcasting. I believe he is making a little bit of confusing overlap between civil aviation from the perspective of flights having to do with tourism and airlift and visitors coming to our shores and the availability of flights and what is coming out of Dallas and wherever else having been stopped. That is a function of tourism and marketing and things of that sort. So there is aviation from the perspective of the tourism industry. How you market, how you promote your air services agreements that you are able to negotiate. And then there is civil aviation which has to do with the technical, the regulatory, the safety aspects. And if you don't get it down pat, correct, with your civil aviation administration, you're going to have your best negotiators to get American Airlines and Delta and all of that. At the end of the day, when the regulatory bodies, including the Supreme One, I think it's called ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, if they say that your regulations and your rules pertaining to your flight operations and the safety of your airports are not up to scratch, 
those airlines, they end getting the clearance, whether from the United States to fly to St. Lucia, they end getting the clearance even from your local civil aviation authorities. And if they don't sign up on it, you can do the best marketing and the best tourism promotion. Those flights are not coming because there are concerns about safety. Let me just give you some examples from the top of my head. They don't necessarily rise to the level. But if they notice, for example, that... <laughs> haven't you noticed when aircraft take off from the George Charles Airport, their first bank is always out to sea. They never stood over castries or anywhere near. That's a safety thing, you know. That's a vulnerable stage. No matter even if you're going to St. Vincent, you do not turn over land, over castries. It's too heavily populated an area. You turn out to the sea, you make the round, and then you go down the coast and you go to St. Vincent. There are the simple things like separation distance between aircraft. <laughs> you know, one aircraft takes off, you have to give it a little bit of time to go because the other aircraft coming behind may be a faster one and it will catch up with the other one and slam into its tail. You have to put separation distance vertically. There are all those kinds of things. And these things have to be monitored and they have to be kept within the parameters that are considered safe. You have helicopters landing there. What are the rules of engagement for helicopters coming so that a slower moving helicopter coming to land doesn't find itself in front of a faster moving aircraft and then you might cause an absolute catastrophe right over a populated area. I'm just drawing these references, your runway. Does, is your runway maintenance where it's supposed to be so that when an aircraft lands there isn't some little stone that some troublesome person threw that is there that should have been removed that caused a, a tire to pop and a nose wheel to collapse and so on. The, 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 the material used for your runway, when you see the engineers tell you they want 32% crushability stone, you better make sure it is within that parameter and so on. That is why the Argyle Airport in St. Vincent took so long. They wanted to make sure that they had all the technical specifications. That is not a function of tourism. That's not a function of marketing. That is a function of civil aviation administration. What are the testing procedures for your air traffic controllers? Do you have testing procedures to make sure that even though marijuana is decriminalized, that one don't come to work high? You don't understand that decriminalization don't mean you're an air traffic controller. You're not supposed to have any substance like that in you because you might end up messing up the aircraft and so on. So I think Senator Fede needs to understand, not to confuse flights and aviation from a tourism marketing perspective and negotiation air services agreements with the technical and regulatory aspects of civil aviation. I haven't taken this out of the way. Senator Feder needs to understand that the lessons of history must not be ignored or forgotten or discarded very lightly. They must be remembered. There is a reason why there has been an evolution in terms of how we treat with our national sovereignty. The existence of ECHA, as indeed the existence of, for example, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, are not some conspiratorial attempts to usurp the national sovereignty of St. Lucia. Okay? I, I never said you said that. I'm making my point. I'm speaking. So, I'm talking to you still, Mr. Deputy President. Don't you bother with that, you know? They are not any attempt to usurp our sovereignty. What we have done over the course of our growing integration is that we have understood that there are certain areas we're trying to uphold and fly a flag and insist upon national sovereignty is not in our best interest. In that integration, we have evolved what I would call supranational institutions and organizations that can represent the collective. So that you don't have every state trying to pull its weight in such a critical thing as international civil aviation, where we are relatively small fry, our negotiating power, our power to go to the conferences where things like the Chicago Convention, whatever were hammered out, is limited, that we decided or we came together and collectivized our negotiating position. We collectivized basically our representative capacity. We collectivize our operational capability. In other words, the regulatory requirements that are there, that we are able to implement them better when we act collectively. Let us not forget, there is a great level of integration in the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. One of its institutions is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, and the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority is another of its organs. Therefore, when you have a director general 
It is not like this director general has been empowered to act on a frolic of his own. No, sir. He has to answer and work in accordance with the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. Okay? The director is a person, he's the chief executive, but he answers to a board which is called the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. That Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority is empowered whether directly or by delegates of the respective ministers that are responsible for civil aviation. So, for example, St. Lucia's Minister for Civil Aviation, Honorable Alva Baptist, an ex-air traffic controller, a man with a master's degree in, in, in air transportation administration, whatever it is, and so on. But the representative that he, as the minister, is empowered to name to the authority is Dr. Sean Matthews, the former high representative at SLASPA, who's now a big person at Global Port Holdings. He's our most re recent appointee to ECA, the Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority. They set policy, and their policy is informed by the minister who represented them. What they don't want is that a minister to be capriciously, to be in any kind of ad hoc, in a manner that is politically expedient, to be making decisions pertaining to civil aviation administration to the collective organization of the OECS, as opposed to technocrats, technicians, people who have their minds wrapped around it, that they can set the policy and that they can do it. As I heard many, many, many years ago, he was not that even with the St. Lucia Labour Party. Dr. Von Riss, then Director General of the OECS, made a statement over at Point Seraphim. They were having a meeting to discuss OECS political unity. And very animatedly, he came and he said, look, we need to understand when we have an organization like the OECS, we have not given up our independence. What we have done is that we pull together our individual independences so that we can have a greater independence. That is an independence that is fed, that is nourished, that is nurtured, that is sustained by the collective input of nations that are joined together by a treaty, no less, so that they are able to fare better in the international arena where such treaties and agreements and conventions are absolutely vital. To do otherwise is to risk exactly what happened to us, a downgrade. And it could have been worse. And when those downgrades come, they can have a tremendous effect even on your best tourism marketing and air services negotiations. Because when you see you don't meet certain criteria that they consider are vital, not just for the technical safety of aircraft, but a security, whether your security procedures and so on, they may allow for a terrorist to slip through or some kind of baggage checking not to be really up to scratch and so on. You can end up losing a lot more. This is not one of the places where we can or should even try to go it alone. We do so and the fissures and cracks of our individual vulnerabilities will overwhelm even our best intentions. I heard those things mentioned some time ago when I was in this house when we were talking about the credit reporting bill. Some people did not understand the great role that the, that the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank had to play in the whole credit reporting matter. That this is a supranational regional institution that is tethered to us by treaty, but that it is not acting on a frolic of its own. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, I think, is directed by the Council of Ministers, the, 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 the Council of Finance Ministers of, or the Monetary Council, and the Monetary Council is represented by finance ministers. So any fears one may have about the terms of reference and the parameters within which the Director of Civil Aviation may operate need to remember that he is governed by, he is controlled by, he is informed by a civil aviation authority which itself draws its authority from the individual ministers of civil aviation, not necessarily directly, but through their delegates, as Honorable Alva Baptist delegate to ECA is Dr. Sean Matthews. So the policy direction of St. Lucia is definitely going to be felt, is definitely going to be channeled through that governance authority, just like our ECCB is informed and governed through the Monetary Council, which really is a body comprising ministers responsible for finance and monetary policy and things of that kind. We've come too long a distance. We've come too far in the evolution of how we treat with our national sovereignty and our independence and so on, for us to even look back and to have any lament or cry or grieve over the loss of sovereignty. 
It has served us. It has benefited as well. We need more of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy President. Our leader of government business. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I was not aware that in this chamber, we, I know my colleague has a wide range of experience and expertise, but I was pleasantly intrigued by his ability to uh, navigate and have a safe approach and landing on this particular intervention. So I thank him. And I think it has enlightened many of us who may have had a little issue understanding some of the business or the issues that are related to civil aviation and the implications. Uh, just to add, Madam President, on my Mr. Deputy President, with my brief um, rebuttal here, that while it is true that sometimes we feel as if the international external forces are imposing on us, as we have noticed in many areas, the Finance Management Act is one of them, where you feel as if sometimes the hands of the Minister of Finance is tight. The issue with CIP is another one, where the international, some of these international big boys want to, even when you have done everything they ask you to do with your due diligence and everything, they still have pressure on you. Uh, but when you look behind the scenes, the same countries that they're telling you you can't do business with, <laughs> they're doing it. When we come to the cannabis uh, bill in a while, you will also note, Mark, Mr. Deputy, that in some of these places, there are, there are restrictions about where revenue that you raise in cannabis can go. But these very people are deriving revenue from that cannabis that they spend and they use in their own country. So yes, there is an argument about our sovereignty, but I think it is also true, based on what um, my colleague has mentioned, that we as a country sometimes must also pay attention to our collective responsibility in the case of ECHA for that particular bill, where the decisions are not just St. Lucia doing its own thing, but we belong to a collective team, and they help to design the, design the regulations. So let me just say one thing to the opposition in that regard. There are other regional institutions that we belong to, and we are subjected to the collective decisions that they make. And one of them is CARICOM. I remember a few years ago, I stood over there, and that presentation was recorded and sent to me by someone. I didn't even know it was. And then I realized I had to be standing there reminding the government then that when CARICOM makes a decision as a collective, we are bind it's binding for us, we're part of it, that St. Lucia cannot then on its own go and do its own thing. And I'm saying that to make a point. There was a time when there was an issue in Venezuela and there was a big crisis with Gaudo and I think it was Maduro, the two. One, one, one president and another one claiming to be president. And CARICOM took a decision. St. Lucia is a member of CARICOM. The heads of CARICOM decided that we are taking a decision where we are sticking with what is um, what exists now and recognizing the sovereignty of this country with a particular president. But a few people, a few members of CARICOM, including our then Prime Minister, his or the Prime Minister at the time who was who is now in opposition, decided to go on a tangent alongside two or three other members of, of, of the CARICOM team and who were subscribing to what we call the Lima Group. I don't know if you remember that. It was a renegade group that decided that they were going to side with certain people to recognize a certain person as president. And at the time, I said, we must be very careful as a sovereign state who we align ourselves with, particularly when CARICOM has made a particular decision. Mr. President, uh, I rise in the point of order. Um, Senator Fede, yes. Yeah, the member is grossly misleading the House. Um, there is no treaty that St. Lucia or any CARICOM members are, treaty are, are, are signatory to that binds them in law 
to take a position on matters of foreign policy. The OECS is far deeper in terms of its integration than CARICOM. And so, apart from the CSME and a few other things, CARICOM is very loose, my friend. And so, just be very careful. CARICOM heads did not take a position. I mean, there's a reason why there are four CARICOM countries that are with Taiwan and the others are not. Because there is still that flexibility for CARICOM countries to take their individual position on foreign policy. And so the former prime minister, which is the leader of the opposition, my leader, was very much okay, within his right to take a position based on how he is convinced about it. If your government sees Venezuela differently, that's your prerogative. Thank you. Um, continue, please. Our leader. Yeah. Mr. Deputy. Mr. 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 Deputy President, so I know it's very unusual, but I, I want you to permit me, please, for my edification and clarification. I thought when we reached the point of the summing up by the mover of a motion or the presenter of a bill, that whatever anybody else felt at that stage, that to use a cricketing analogy with which my member opposite, that you're out of reviews at that time. I find it very frequent here. Yeah, in other words, at the point at the point of summing up, why is the honourable why is the honourable senator he's still, he's at still that point? he's still entitled to rise on a point of order, which is which is what he said he was doing. Um, he's still entitled to rise on a point of order. Um, but please continue, honourable leader of government. Yes, you see, Mr. Deputy, he did rise on a point of order, but I still I'm still trying to figure out what it was, the point of order. But anyhow, I will obey your instructions to continue. And to sum up here, maybe it's a good time to sum up because this sometimes can be very tiring. My point here, Mr. Deputy, is this, while I agree that we are sovereign state, and in fact, we had an informal discussion about this, myself and the, op the op leader of opposition business, um, when he made reference to we've been castrated, so to speak, as, you know, and I, and I did have a, a common view on some of the foreign... Um, imposition on our various jurisdiction by entities. I said so. But I was saying, while this may be so, when we talk, talk about ECHA as, as is referenced in this particular bill, we have to be very careful not to just go on our own tangents like we did when his leader joined a set of people who were supporting the Lima Group which was against the, the um, advice of CARICOM. I'm not saying we signed a treaty. I never said we, we signed a treaty. Or we, I just said that they, 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 they went on the tangent. So I, he's importing information that I did not say, I didn't speak about. We never signed any agreement. But aligning yourself with, you know, when I said aligning yourself, I was making the point, Mr. Deputy, that you see ECHO, it is a collective it's an, an organization that provides us with guidance. And we, when we are part of those things, we sometimes have to toe the line as to what our own individual positions are. That's my argument. And so, if I hit a nerve there, perhaps that was the case. I am not sorry, but that was not what I was trying to do. So, yeah, it's very sensitive once his leader gets into the, con the conversation. So, Mr. Deputy, I thank you for... Um, engaging, allowing us to engage on this one, and I look forward to the amendment being made. Thank you. Senators, the question is that the Civil Aviation Amendment Bill be read a second time. I now put the question. As many are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. An act to amend the Civil Aviation Act, Cap 8.07. Clause 2. Interpretation. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 3. Amendment of Section 2. Clause 3 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 4. Amendment of Section 4. 
Clause 4 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 5. Amendment of Section 6. Clause 5 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 6. Amendment of Section 7. Clause 6 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 7. Amendment of Section 10. Clause 7 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 8. Amendment of Section 11. Clause 8 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 9. Amendment of Section 13. Clause 9 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 10. Amendment of Section 31. Clause 10 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 11. Amendment of Section 32. Clause 11 stands part of the bill. Aye. Aye. Clause 12. Amendment of Section 33. Clause 12 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 13. Amendment of Section 38. Clause 13 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 14. Amendment of Section 40. Clause 14 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 15. Substitution of Section 46. Clause 15 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 16. Amendment of Section 49. Clause 16 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 17. Amendment of Section 50. Clause 17 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 18. Amendment of Section 51. Clause 18 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 19. Amendment of Section 52. Clause 19 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 20. Amendment of Section 53. Clause 20 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 21. Repeal of Section 54. Clause 21 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 22. Repeal of Section 55. Clause 22 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Senators. The question is that the committee rises and the bill reported. I now put the question. As many are of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many are of the contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senators, I beg to report that the Civil Aviation Amendment Bill went through committee stage with no amendments. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and that the bill be read a third time and passed. Senators, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and a Civil Aviation Amendment Bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many of that of our contrary opinion, sorry, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Be it enacted by the King's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This Act may be cited as the Civil Aviation Amendment Act 2023. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. Deputy President, I beg to present for first reading a bill shortly entitled Regulated Substances. Regulated Substances. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. Deputy President, I beg that the suspense, for the suspension of Standing Order 492 to allow this bill to go through its remaining stages at this city. Senators, the question is that Standing Order number 492 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Leader of Government Business to proceed with the remaining stages of, this, of the bill at this sitting. I now put the question. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. As many of our contrary opinions say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Please proceed. I'm of government this.
Thank you, Sergeant. Mr. Deputy President, I beg to move for a second reading of bill shortly entitled Regulated Substances. I wish to remind the Senate, Mr. President, that some time ago, in fact, about two years ago, this government, upon assuming office, came to this House, and I think it may have been the very first piece of legislation within the first 100 days that we came to this House and Senate to pass and deal with. And that was the decriminalization of a specific quantity of cannabis, what we refer to as marijuana, and for me, especially for particular um, uses, medical, recreational, and also to expunge criminal records of persons who would have been convicted for possession of small quantities of cannabis. Madam Deputy, Madam President, having done that as a government, it was a clear signal and indication to our people that this government was no, not only talking about cannabis, was not only giving lip service to a very sensitive and critical discussion that had been taking place in this country for many years, but that we were ready to begin to act on the commitments that we gave our people ahead of the elections and even prior to our exit of, of, in, from office in 2016. Madam President, having come through with the legislation, we have had to go back and have quite a lot of engagement with various stakeholders. And you would have heard and seen the presence of some of these people who have worked very hard alongside the government and alongside other stakeholders to advance the cause and the ideas that emanate from that concept of commercializing, decriminalizing, and some people now want to say legalizing. But the discussion about the development of a cannabis industry and a cannabis regime. Madam President, this bill represents yet another step in that direction. I am very proud to say today that we have not put this on the back burner, but we have come back to take one more step towards achieving what we believe is a very ambitious but very important um, engagement that I think will benefit not only persons who are interested in using cannabis perhaps for ritualistic recreational purposes, but for people who are interested in this as an industry. Madam President, this bill really seeks to establish a number of things. But let me highlight five of the main, the main ones that it seeks to, to deal with. First of all, this bill seeks to establish what we call a regulated substance authority. That's one of them. It also seeks to establish a regulated substances tribunal. It also seeks to establish a regulated substances fund. It, is, it seeks to provide for licenses of the regulated substances. And it also wishes to establish enforcement on matters relating to these regulations. So, this, there are multiple functions or multiple objectives that this bill um, has. Let me try to just elaborate briefly on each of these so that we have a better understanding of what it seeks to do. Madam President, it is geared towards ensuring that having removed the previously draconian measures, what we, can, what we, we saw as really unfair in the way we treated and provisions that we made for people who were using cannabis, where people went to jail for a spliff while others roamed the streets having done much worse things. We believe that it was also time for us to establish a, legislate, uh, a, a legal framework for the cultivation, the use, and the sale of cannabis in St. Lucia. 
Now, Mr. Madam Deputy, Madam President, while it is a step in the diversification of the economy, and we will appreciate that any any other way in which you can diversify the economy is welcome, but it is not just a, a simple, straightforward process where one day you go to bed and next day you get up and you have a big cannabis industry. It doesn't work that way. And we have to be mindful of what is happening in other jurisdictions who have gone that way. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in the state of Colorado, and some places who have more resources and have more experience in dealing with that. So we have to be very careful in how we proceed. It is not a simple process, uh, Madam President. We need to be cautious and meticulous in the way we approach this. And so there has to be a legislative framework to, 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 to be established to ensure that we approach this in the most cautious, meticulous, and efficient manner. Madam President, in part one of the bill, it is established or it establishes a regulatory authority and a statutory, which is a statutory board which will be um, established to regulate, um, among other substances, cannabis. And it will also provide oversight for that, the management of these regulations. Part two of the bill refers to and has a requirement for licensing, the licensing process, which includes applications, which includes parameters for approval. In part three of the bill, Madam President, there is established a tribunal to facilitate and to address grievances and to have avenues for review and, re and regress in the event that there are issues that have to be addressed. Madam President, in part four of the bill, we see that it has established regulatory substances fund, a regulatory substances fund. And that fund has designated, is designated and has a, a clearly articulated what the use of the funds will be for. And that is specified in clause 77 of the bill, which states that the purpose of the funds would be to facilitate the operations of the Regulated Substances Authority at least for the first three years. Thereafter, you would have hoped that there, is some, there would have been some level of um, strengthening and that the authority would become self-sufficient. Madam President, some of the, the funds will also be used for the following. Scientific research and development because we need to begin to understand the industry better. And as you might have known, Madam President, or heard, with this kind of this thing, there are certain standards, grades, and quality that people have to meet. So it's not just growing, growing weed and just doing what you want. There are very scientific um, approaches to it. So part of this fund would be to finance the, science, the research, the development, and the education drive. I'll repeat that lest some of us in here did say that we didn't hear it. The education drive that is going to be used to sensitize the public about the use and getting involved in this industry. It is very important that with a, a, a cannabis, as we know, which if not used correctly can become problematic, that there be some level of public awareness and education, particularly among vulnerable groups such as students and high-risk groups. We have heard our CMO mention, Madam President, that they have detected certain substances that students have been ingesting in candies and in other, you know, delicacies at school that, that, that seem to have contained um, banned substances or substances that can affect their behavior. And so any country or any jurisdiction that is going to engage in that industry must ensure that there is a proper education campaign to sensitize and raise awareness of its citizens about what should entail, what should be done, and what, what are the do's and don'ts. Madam President, the funding is also going to be used, and I think Senator Jean-Pierre might be interested in that one, to manage the social, economic, social, emotional, and psychological support for persons dealing with regulated substances. Not only cannabis, but remember it's regulated substances. Because as we speak, there are other things that 
we need to consider, and one of them is probably down the road, nuclear energy, and some of, if you look at what's going on around the world, some of these things are going to reach our doorsteps very soon, and we need to be ready for them. So while we will be focusing on cannabis now, but the, regula the, the regulation or the regulatory, um, the substance regulatory, the regulated substances um, authority is not only focused on cannabis, but is going to set the tone and set the, the bar to manage other substances. And there, thereby you may have issues of emotional, psychological support that may be required by people who deal with them. Madam President, it also, this fund will also um, take care of safe storage and disposal of these substances. As you would appreciate, if you're dealing with regulated substances, these things have to be handled carefully. Not everybody should be able to access, use, and you know, indiscriminately deal with them. So there has to be some measure of regulatory, regulatory procedure. And Madam President, the revenue raised from the industry could also be used um, in my in, in, in my expectation and that of all of us who are part of this process to benefit those who are involved in the industry. Madam President, by far, by, uh, part five, five of the bill um, deals with enforcement. And as I mentioned, enforcement is important because you can have rules, you can have regulations, but if you don't enforce, they are as good as just being on paper. And so enforcement of the provisions of the bill would ensure that the duly authorized persons um, are empowered to ensure that they deal with the provisions that the bill um, has to adhere to. Madam President, in part six of the bill, it speaks to the confidentiality oath and secrecy included in section 90. So it, there are certain things that will, will, will be required that are not everybody's business, but have to be dealt with very delicately. Um, so Madam President, the bill that we table this, the, in, in this house, um, we will be coming back, not this bill, but this amendment, we will be coming back very soon to table, um, to table the, the, um, <coughs> the cannabis bill itself. And we hope that by the time we do so, there would have been, not we hope, but we will ensure that by the time we do so, there would have been even more consultation. Because even before we came here, the consultation had started. And you would have heard a list of the stakeholders who have been part of this consultation. And let me just remind the Senate of some of them that we will continue to engage and consult with. Madam President, we will engage the Cannabis Commission, the Cannabis Task Force, the Ionola Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, ICA, Invest St. Lucia, the Ministry of Health, the St. Lucia Medical and Dental Association, SLMDA, the Bureau of Standards, the Ministry of Justice, the Office of the Attorney General, the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of External Affairs, the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association, SLHTA, the Forensic Lab, the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, Event St. Lucia, the Bankers Association, and all of these stakeholders have been part of this effort. And we must continue to engage them. And there are others, but I listed at least those that are at the forefront of our discussion. And we will continue to engage because this is a very delicate step that many countries have thought about, have not taken. I think Jamaica has been bold, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Eastern Caribbean. But a lot of our Caribbean neighbors are talking about it, but a little bit cheapish in taking the steps. So we understand that it will require a lot of consultation and collaboration, but we have braved the storm and we have decided that we are going to do so. Madam President, I also want us to think ahead and consider um, the additional legislation that we may need to put in place to deal with, like I mentioned, other issues that relate to dealing with um, substances or threats, quote unquote, um, including nuclear and radioactive energy. We have to consider those things because they're not far away from us. And we have to consider legislation in, in terms of substance, um, substance, regulated substances, that when the time comes, that we will be ready to deal with these. So the cannabis discussion is in the, at, the, at the front burner, 
But let us keep in mind that this discussion may have to extend to other regulated substances that may not be an issue now, but with the way things are going, with people exploring alternative sources of energy, uh, more efficient ways to be able to save and to be more efficient, we may have to be talking about um, nuclear and radioactivity down the road. So this sets the basis and the foundation for us to be able to regulate when we are ready to um, create a more vibrant and beneficial cannabis industry for this country. But let us not in any way give the impression to our people that St. Lucia is ready to have a thriving cannabis industry and everybody's going to make money right away. No. It, we are setting the foundation. We are putting the legislative framework in place. We are talking to the people who know how this is done. We have had our Minister of Commerce visit um, the, the countries that have attempted to engage in this industry, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have been trying to look at the models that have worked and some of the mistakes that our other colleagues have made before we just jump into this thing and think that we can just make everybody happy. So this is another step and uh, as I said, we will be coming back to this house to methodically and um, strategically work with this cannabis industry and what to see how we can explore for the benefit of our people in this country, particularly the Rastafarian community that has been talking about it for a very long time to see how it can be best maximized and utilized for the benefit of our people. So I put this to the Senate for its approval and concurrence. I thank you, Madam President. Senators, the question is that the regulated substances bill, that the regulated substances bill be read a second time. I now put, oh, just go ahead. Senator Fede? Yeah, sorry. I was, I was waiting for you, Madam President. My apologies. Yeah. Uh, Madam President, um, just a brief uh, few comments on this bill. Um, Madam President, this is a very, very long journey, very long debate in the Caribbean, uh, mixed with very passionate feelings. Um, on one hand, you have the conservatives. Uh, that see this differently. Another, on the other hand, you have people for a long time who have been suggesting that the time had come for cannabis, uh, locally known as marijuana, um, to be legalized or decriminalized um, for recreational, medicinal, and religious reasons. Madam President, at the forefront of this debate, and the, the chief advocates has been the Rastafarian community. And I believe that if there's any applause that needs to be given today, it has to be to the Rastafarian committee for their long-standing and outstanding advocacy on this particular matter. Regardless of which administration has been um, at the helm of the government, whether it's the St. Lucia, St. Lucia Labour Party or the United Workers Party, we have seen the Rastafarians, they have held to one consistent theme, and that is, it was time for us as a country to overcome our fears, overcome our trepidation, and to, in fact, um, legalize the whole question of the cultivation, the production, uh, the usage for recreational purposes, they have argued for medicinal and religious purposes. Um, there is this contending debate, and it has been for a long time, as to whether you go to the full legalization or you decriminalize, uh, making the use of cannabis a um, civil matter or a criminal matter, or whether you go to the full legalization. I don't know what the approach of this administration will be, um, but I look forward to the leader of government business in his rebuttal to give some more clarity uh, as he has indicated that the government will be bringing uh, uh, another bill um, to deal with the whole question of cannabis 
and in its in its true form. So this motion today, Madam President, that deals with setting up a a regulated environment for substances. Um, I have a few concerns, as do some of my colleagues in the lower house. Um, one of the first concerns that we have, and that is given the um, fundamental and leading role that the Rastafarian committee, um, community would have played in the advocacy of this matter, we're asking why was a more deliberate effort not made to ensure that in the formation of the board that the Rastafarian committee would have been represented properly. Madam President, in the uh, formation of the board in section um, appointment of the board section 2 of the legislation, I know that the government could easily argue that where it says civil society groups and where it says persons specialize in medicine, that they can. But I can't, I can't. Hello? Okay. And so, um, Madam President, while the page 18 of the legislation, and so while in page 18, uh, section 22, it goes on, uh, the board comprises of the permanent secretary, so very deliberate then, um, in the ministry, it says the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Finance as well. I think at the same token, um, we should have had a deliberate mention of the Rastafarian Committee. We also have the director of the Bureau of Standards um, for obvious reasons. But I believe that it is crucial because of the significant role that the Rastafarian community have played in the advancement of this uh, legislation that what we should do is to make sure that we are very deliberate and not just leave it to the interpretation of whoever the minister is, whether a civil society group could be construed as someone else. I think that we should ensure that the Rastafarian community is paid the respect that it deserves, that it is given the honor and the absolute salute that it requires for the role that it has played in the advancement of this. Madam President, the Rastafarian community have been talking about the um, evolution of the cannabis industry for uh, as long as this has been taboo in St. Lucia. Uh, they have been the pioneers, they have been the one who have had the courage to come out and to say, look, the time has come for our religious freedoms to be respected for the medicinal value of marijuana to be um, advanced as a, as a healing um, instrument. They have been the ones advocating for recreational purpose, for persons constitutional rights to be adhered to and be upheld uh, in the nation's treatment towards the substance of cannabis. So I do believe that they should be credited, Madam President, uh, for their hard and painstaking um, contribution to this. Madam President, Section 6 um, of the legislation, and sorry to be not going in chronological order, um, but page 13 for ease of flow, and Section 6 of the legislation which talks about the functions of the authority, um, I and I heard a bit from the leader of government business that we ought to be cautious because, Madam President, he's exactly right. And, and you know, I don't always agree with the leader of government business, but in this instance, I will agree with him because we've seen research suggests that in its bureau, the Jamaican experience has been, they have seen an increase in the um, substance abuse situation in that country ever since they enacted legislation um, to legalize and to cultivate and to produce cannabis 
for recreational, medicinal, and religious purposes. So, Madam President, um, so I, I like in the bill that provisions are made for a comprehensive public health education and training program to raise public awareness, especially for high-risk individuals. Um, very crucial, Madam President, because uh, we are entering into a very serious and very sensitive era, um, and, and persons may not have had the experience of dealing um, with this um, very, uh, very, very, very uh, sensitive situation. Social and emotional and mental support programs for persons dealing with a regulated substance. I'm very, very intrigued as to why the government feels it necessary to put that, but very, very intriguing clause that the government here puts that they need to ensure that the social, the emotional, and the mental fabric of individuals, that there are programs that are put in place. I'm reading uh, section six of the bill, and if you go down to J, subsection J, clauses I to, sorry, one to Roman numerals four. Yeah? Um, where it referenced those substances where the framers of this bill, I'm sure that they would have looked at other pieces of legislation as well in other parts of the world where cannabis um, is, is legal and where there's a practice of using this for recreational purposes. And they have found it prudent to put in the bill that the emotional and mental programs to deal with the emotional and mental state of individuals is very, very necessary. And that is instructive, Madam President, in that um, we, we have to proceed with caution. And, you know, I remember being part of the cabinet uh, in the last uh, administration, and the member for Chozelle and the then Minister of Commerce, Honorable Bradley Felix, did a considerable amount of work um, to advance this, this process and this, um, this cause. And there are a lot of discussion back and forth, Madam President, in the cabinet as it relates to how do we proceed, what is the best way forward, um, and, and there was a lot of discussion as well. Um, the commission had done a lot of consultation, Madam President, and again at that time, the Rastafarian community had been at the forefront of these discussions to make sure that every single aspect of, of the um, advancement into this was covered because, Madam President, um, we're, we're dealing into unknown waters and we have to approach carefully, as the leader of government business has said. Then, uh, in clause uh, Roman numeral th three, it says, proper procedures for the safe storage and disposal of regulated substances. So, again, the framers of this legislation ensuring that the necessary work is done so that um, cannabis does not get into the wrong hands of individuals who may not be old enough, who may not be experienced enough in um, the usage or dealing or the handling of cannabis. Um, Madam President, there are a lot of people, if you do a poll in this room and you ask people, when was the first time you smoked paper or when you smoked tobacco or when you stole one of your father's cigarette, I'm sure that you would get a lot of interesting stories around this room. But what you have to make sure, and this clause is important, is that the storage is done in a proper manner because stealing your father's cigarette is a totally different manner from stealing a spliff uh, from someone else or a spliff ended up in the wrong hand. So I'm very, 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 very happy to see that um, that due care is taken to make sure that these, um, these eventualities are covered. Madam President, Roman numerals four. Uh, to consult with the minister for setting the retail price of a regulated substance based on market trends. Now, I found that to be intriguing because um, it says to me that there is some measure of price control that the government will be considering. Um, certainly, this suggested where 
um, the uh, the authority would actually be advising the minister for the setting of the retail price of cannabis. Um, I thought that market forces would be allowed to contend in such a manner, uh, but in this case um, we see that the intention is is that there will be some level of price control. So if you're a, 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 a farmer, and there are many farmers already, Mr. Um, Madam Speaker, if you are a farmer under the legal framework, um, the government will be setting the prices um, as it relates to cannabis, but it is said that it will be based on market trends, based on the interpretation of the minister. Um, that I find intriguing. I thought that market forces would be allowed to contend um, as we go through this. Uh, the red tape for this, Madam President, um, is very, very, very tenuous. Uh, there's a lot that um, one would have to do to qualify. Um, there's a whole long list of requirements that one would have to meet in order to be um, a, a, a player within the sector, should I put it that way. So it will be very interest to, uh, interesting to see how this is going to, um, to play out. The government has also made provisions, Madam President, in, in the financing of the authority, the section that spoke to it, um, where it says that funds for the authority, and if you look at the section that deals with uh, the fund for the board, that one of the provisions made here is that the authority can also um, levy a tax on the, the activities pertaining to cannabis as part of the initiatives. So while it says that um, it will also look at grants and subventions from the ministry, um, the government, in terms of funding the, the, the activities of the, of the um, authority, will also consider a tax. So not even the marijuana farmers can escape this government's pension for taxes. But Madam President, um, it would also be interesting to see what level of concessions that the government is going to give. So I see that um, you know, there are provisions made in the legislation, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but I'm hoping that there will also be concessions to get farmers started um, as we approach other forms of agriculture um, if we are intending to make this a success. Madam President, I look at the Caribbean experience, and I know that Jamaica has got legislation, I know St. Vincent has got legislation, and Antigua has got legislation as the three CARICOM countries um, that have gone this route to look at um, marijuana and cannabis um, as a means of economic um, diversity, if you will, and agricultural diversi diversification. But I am not sure whether the government has any information to share with this Honorable House as it relates to the success of those countries and what sort of economic track record that this has had in terms of um, the, the, those islands' capacity uh, to be able to generate significant sums of economic opportunity jobs and taxes for their peoples. That would be quite enlightening. So I'm hoping that the leader of government business will, will, would actually share um, that information with us if it's, if it's, if it's available. Um, Internationally, though, I think it poses a bit of a challenge. Madam President, I am not aware of any federal law within the United States, although there are 24 um, states that have legalized cannabis. Um, in the European Union, which is another one of our traditional allies, I know that Holland has been a, an outlier for a long time, um, but Malta happens to be one of the only other EU countries that have actually enacted legislation where cannabis is legal. So there's still a lot of ground to cover globally um, and still a lot of lobbying that needs to be done. The senator a while ago gave us a, a very long 
um, I would say sermon on regional integration and hopefully the government may have a plan where there'll be a coming together of the various Caribbean countries to lobby um, other Caribbean countries that are seemingly rather conservative and rather cautious in the application of um, cannabis legislation, but as well to allow this to become a global force um, that it needs to be for it to be a success. We need to have access to other markets. Madam President, if it's not legal in the EU, then it would mean our farmers would have difficulty shipping it to Martinique, um, as an example. Uh, and if it's not legal in the EU, markets like Guadeloupe and um, other parts of the um, European Caribbean would find it extremely difficult for um, legally produced goods in our jurisdiction to enter those countries. I know that my colleagues have a lot to say in that vein as well. Um, but I'll stop here for now, Madam President, and I do want to submit these comments to the government. Thank you. Need of government business? Oh, my beg your pardon. Senator Lee. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> Madam President, I read this piece of legislation um, with a bit of disquiet, I must confess. And listening to the presentations this evening thus far have not done much to settle that disquiet. The difficulty I have, Madam President, is when I read this legislation, I didn't know what it applied to. The Regulated Substances Act does not mention cannabis in it anywhere. I understand that's the intention that this is what it's supposed to regulate, at least from listening to the leader of government business, one of the possible things it may regulate. And to be honest, that is where my disquiet begins. When I look at the definition of regulated substance in the interpretation section in section two, at page 11, it merely states that a regulated substance means a substance that's declared as a regulated substance under section four. Section four in turn then says, the minister may, may by order published in the Gazette declare a substance to be a regulated substance. No limitation, no clarification, no explanation as to what the basis might be for the minister declaring this thing to be a regulated substance. And, order, and then two, it goes on, an order under subsection one must specify the scientific name or other name of the substance, the description of the substance, and any other information relating to the substance. So I thought, okay, we need scientific names, so that means we're dealing perhaps with inorganic compounds. Hydrogen oxide is an inorganic compound. It has a scientific name. It has a scientific, um, and people are looking at me strangely, hydrogen oxide is H2O. It has a scientific um, description. And so therefore, conceivably, it could be regulated as a regulated substance. Because as I said, the act does not institute any limits or create any limits as to what can be declared a regulated substance. And there's always the admonition that you, when you legislate, you have to legislate for all idiots and you have to legislate for when you are out of government as well. So whatever good intentions you may have, you have to recognize that once you've passed an all-encompassing piece of legislation like this, it can be used for any purpose going forward. And that is my primary concern, that it is way too wide. It creates the, the possibility of anything really becoming deemed a regulated substance and therefore falling, subs um, falling under the regime of this act. I then had to read through the act and try to assess it again without a context because I didn't know what this is regulating. I don't understand exactly how it is supposed to apply. That being said, there, there were a few things that did jump out at me uh, and I'm suspect if I read it again now understanding what it is for, perhaps more might jump out at me. Um, for example, page 18, section 20. In fact, before we get there, let me deal with um, section 8 on page 15. 
which says that the authority may delegate its functions and powers under section six and seven to the chief executive officer or an employee of the authority, which is concerning to me given the wide remit that this authority has. You've gone through the, the, the effort of creating an authority, creating a board, although as the honorable leader of um, opposition business noted, there's some concern as to the constitution of that board, but then you've gone and given that board significant powers, for example, to impose conditions on a license, to issue licenses, to suspend and revoke licenses, um, to consider licenses. This is under section six. Um, they have the right to create manual and electronic tracking systems for the regulated substance. Then you have under section seven, the powers of the authority also to appoint a committee to assist it effectively and efficiently in performing its functions. I'm not sure exactly why a committee is necessary if you've created a board. Um, to request a licensee to have a regulated substance tested at a prescribed lab laboratory. To inspect licensed premises. To consult and collaborate with government um, agencies as it considers necessary or expedient. Um, again, to charge and collect and prescribe. And this is, again, what I'm, I'm most concerned about if you're delegating these authorities to the um, chief executive officer, there's nothing saying that they cannot delegate this power to prescribe non-refundable license fee, to prescribe a refundable security bond fee, to prescribe fees for a service provided by the authority, to waive the requirement of a payment of a license fee to obtain, and, and this is concerning to me, because you have you moved from a situation where you had a, a board or an authority to a single person who we then have to rely on the integrity and the probity of that single individual, particularly as regards waiver of licenses and the requirement for licenses and for the, the implementation sorry, of conditions for the license. Um, you then had, so that was my concern of section eight. I was concerned with section 20, which is on page 18 which provides that the minister may, on the recommendation of cabinet, and after consultation with the chairperson of the board, give written directions to the authority as the minister considers necessary in the public interest. Now again, there's no, I understand that it would be for the minister to determine what the public interest is, and I expect that if anybody has concerns, they can challenge. But I am curious as to why a minister would be wanting to give written directions to an authority. This is apart from setting policy, which I understand would be purely within the remit of the minister. But then you've moved from that position where the minister establishes policy to be able to give directions on whatever matter, for whatever reason the, the minister feels necessary, as long as he can justify it as being in the public interest. I believe if you've gone through the, the, the problem, not a problem, gone through the process, I should say, sorry, of creating a supposedly independent body to administer this um, act that they should remain independent and should not be subject to direction by the minister. Um, again, when I looked at the, the membership of the of the of the board of the authority, um, I didn't see what the connection was, why they were being appointed, what the purpose was, and then again listening to the um, leader of government business. I wonder how, for example, qualified the board as made up here would be to regulate, for example, nuclear um, power, which I believe the Honorable Leader of Government Business mentioned. Yeah, I understand it's for future, but, that's, but they are such distinct um, cannabis on one hand, nuclear power on the other hand. The expertise necessary to regulate and control those two things, to my mind, and that's a, my uninformed mind, are very disparate. I'm not sure that you can have one agency. And as I said, the problem I have is that it, it, there's no limitation to what this agency can regulate. It could be regulating pesticides. It could be regulating prescription drugs. It could be regulating nuclear energy. It could be regulating um, gasoline. Whatever anybody thinks needs to be regulated could conceivably come under this piece of legislation. And the more things you're regulating, the more expertise will be required to regulate it in a sensible fashion. Because as I indicated, for example, 
the requirements, the needs, the concerns as surround the cannabis industry are going to be radically different from the needs, the concerns, uh, and, and the requirements of regulating nuclear power. So I'm not sure that having one omnibus piece of legislation to govern all these things is in the best interest. I understand the concern perhaps to limit the expense involved, but frankly, if we're going to do it, we need to do it properly. Um, and again, so my... Under part three, um, page two, that's section 65, where it says cabinet shall appoint the tribunal, which is the tribunal um, that is known as the Regulated Substances Tribunal, uh, which can, shall comprise of three persons, which is an attorney at law, um, and then two persons having experience in scientific research or, or finance. There is no term limit stated for these persons. Is it that they are appointed for life? Um, are they subject to renewal? How does that operate? Um, there's, there's something missing here. The, the functions of the, of the tribunal, again, to hear disciplinary matter referred to under section 29.3, appeal against the decision of the board of the authority, and the dispute reg regarding regulated substances. The last one in particular, again, I think is extremely wide. How do we define what these disputes are? And how do we ensure that the tribunal is not stepping on the jurisdiction of the High Court, for example? Um, again, I think there just needs to be more detail and more clarity in the operation of this piece of legislation. Um, I also had a difficulty well, now that I understand that it involves cannabis, um, my questions with regard to Section 89, which deals with the forfeiture of, um, well, 88 and 89, which deals with the forfeiture of assets which are used in connection with the regulated um, product, I can somewhat understand its application. But that being said, I believe that a power of forfeiture is an extreme penalty and care needs to be, con or, or some con um, further consideration needs to put in as to whether it is really necessary in light of the purpose of this piece of legislation. Um, again, under section 91, there was a general penalty which for breach of any section of this act where there's, I guess there's no other penalty specified. In the case of an individual, a fine not exceeding $100,000 or imprisonment for a term not exceeding three years or both. In the case of a company, a fine not exceeding $500,000 or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years or both. I'm not sure how you're going to imprison a company, um, so there's something that needs to be clarified there as well. But I note with concern a trend in a lot of our recent legislation where we seem to be trying to impose the most draconian and heaviest fines that we can. Again, given how wide this piece of legislation is, it's going to cover a wide range of possibilities of breach. Um, and I'm not sure that a fine of $100,000 or a term of imprisonment not exceeding three years or both is really an appropriate, I understand it's the maximum, but I'm again, I'm not understanding, I'm not of the view that this is the appropriate penalty for a general offense. If you have a specific offense that you recognize the severity of it, to my mind, that is where you put in those very heavy penalties. But as a general offense, uh, which may include, for example, just failing to renew your license on time, to be penalized to that extent, to my mind, is excessive and draconian. Um, there was one other issue that had popped. Especially if you ask you legalizing, legalizing the herb. Um, the other concern I had, which is, which is more general, I note that this is supposed to authorize or put in place the, um, or to, to, to inaugurate, I should say, the cannabis industry. 
I just want to remind the government that the Misuse Drugs Prevention, Misuse Drugs, sorry, Misuse and Prevention Act has not been amended to enable the growth of marijuana or, or cannabis on the scale necessary to have a cannabis industry. So we need to make sure that when we are putting this in place, that we have everything covered. For now, it's just for personal use. There's nothing in the act that provides for industrial growth. And I understand that there's the statement that there still has to be some consultation and, and steps put in place. But if we are putting a piece of legislation in place that's supposed to be governing the industry, it needs obviously to make provision for the supply of the product. Um, with those observations and my very, very strong reservation with regard to the width of this piece of legislation, um, these are my submissions for this evening. Are you sound like Babylon, man? <laughs> Senator Charles. Um, Madam President, um, I'm standing here today with mixed emotions with reference to this piece of legislation um, because a few years ago, I think when the debate started, I have to say that I, Nancy Charles, was a very staunch opponent of the both decriminalization and legalization of um, cannabis because, because of the fact that I am from a community and maybe it's for lack of education as well. Um, Madam President, you know sometimes when you oppose something because you have a personal view, um, you do not spend sufficient time to educate yourself about all aspects of the matter and you just stick to your guns and you stick to that personal view and you just say no, I, it's wrong, I don't think we should do it, etc. But I am so grateful that over the years that I have grown and I have learned to look at all aspects of a debate. And I have also grown to understand sometimes as a person involved in either politics, public policy, etc., that sometimes while you may have a personal view about a particular matter, sometimes it is the view of the people that is what's important because the legislation is not necessarily being passed only because of you. There are other members of society that you have to take into consideration. And so I am not standing here to say yes or no, um, but I'm standing here to say that I, I have perhaps broadened my horizon in terms of the argument with the legislation or the proposed legislation for the decriminalization slash legalization whichever one is going to be of cannabis um it's unfortunate that um my appointment was a little bit late and so we got this bill a little bit late and i did not have sufficient time to go through it as i would have loved to but i think i just want to make mention of a few concerns that i have um there may be more but these are some of the things that i i have concerns about that I would like perhaps to bring out there um, to the government and, and, and perhaps other persons because I, as I understand it, we need to have further consultation in furthering the legislation. So um, in, on page 12, section 4, of course, um, the Honorable Senator mentioned that and that was something that stood out for me. I'm, I'm not a lawyer so I don't come from the legal profession but this stood out for me in terms of the minister may by order published in the Gazette declare a substance to be a regulated substance and I thought to myself well what are the guidelines that are going to be used what are the guidelines that the minister will use or who will advise the minister in terms of whether she declares a substance to be regulated or not Obviously, I don't think we expect the minister to wake up one morning and decide that water is going to be regulated or not, or this is going to be... There has to be some scientific evidence or some sort of, you know, some things of substance presented, some argument, facts, etc. presented, and on, under which she will make that decision. And so this one was a little bit off for me because I did not understand how you, the minister would be able to come to the conclusion. I'm glad that my colleague has raised it as well. I'm hoping that the powers that be 
we'll, we'll take this into consideration and, and have further discussion as to the guidance that would be provided or should be provided to the minister in declaring that um, substance a regulated substance. On page 13, under the functions of the authority and the leader of government business spoke about, which was something that I am very concerned about, and this is one of the things or perhaps one of the reasons why I have such great reservations about um, the decriminalization of, of the substance. And that is the comprehensive public health education and training program to raise public awareness especially for high risk group and i know it is there it is in the bill but we have a bad habit madam president in saint lucia where we say something we have it written on paper but we do not put the willpower behind it to ensure that it is done and why am i saying that because a few years ago I think I remember I was following a lot um, Jamaica when they had the decriminalization of a certain amount of cannabis and um, maybe about a week after I think you had some issues with schools because it was quote unquote decriminalized you had a lot of school students who were showing up who would have used um, the substance coming to school and the Ministry of Education had a challenge um, in terms of regulating and ensuring that you know these children were um, perhaps educated sufficiently and so I do not want it to seem Madam President that once the legislation is passed and perhaps there was subsequent to that people think that it's a free for all and say yeah man we can just now go around smoking and doing this etc which is risky behavior and i see it first and foremost in my community um where i'm from a lot of young people who perhaps are not sufficiently educated and maybe strong enough in terms of how do you manage and how do you control what you take in and what your activities are, etc. And it has led to the detriment of a lot of young people, promising young people in the community that you would have thought that perhaps they would have gone on to achieve greater things. And I do not want to say it's only because maybe they have um, resorted to that type of behavior that has gotten them at a stalemate may maybe in their life, but that is part of it. That is a contributing factor. And so I am hoping that the authority is going to take this aspect of the function, of its function, very, very, very seriously to ensure that there is a comprehensive public health education campaign, training to raise the public awareness, at least to let persons understand what are the, um, the pros and the cons, etc., and to help persons in managing and regulating the intake of this controlled substance um, that we're talking about. And especially at the high-risk group, we do understand what is happening in those high-risk groups, even right now, where you have a challenge with law enforcement, with families, with parents, um, especially single mothers being able to help their children and, and, and go astray, etc. And so I'm hoping that the authority is really going to also provide the social, emotional, and mental support programs for persons dealing with a regulated substance. I think a few years ago, I listened to um, an interview by Dr. King, Dr. Stephen King, and I think he was heavily focused on that aspect of providing the social and the emotional and the mental support programs. That is going to go hand in hand. Whatever it is we do in terms of the decriminalization, we have to do that hand in hand with the social, emotional, and mental support program. So one cannot go without the other, and one should not go without the other in us implementing the legislation. That is critical to ensure that we can save a generation of our young people in this country, and that in future, Persons like myself, maybe when I get to be a little bit older, I'm not held accountable and responsible for standing in this parliament and passing this legislation and looking at where our population has gone to. I do have children, Madam President, and I want to be accountable as much as possible to my children in making the right decision. I'm sure perhaps my daughter, who, who the, my eldest daughter might be watching, will be, wow, what a change from my position before, etc. So I'm hoping that you will be proud of me standing up and making that declaration today. Um, on page 20, um, Madam President, 
on the disqualification of a member of a board. Now I understand my, my, my colleague would have made mention of the constitution of the board. And whilst it is a concern of ours that the, um, the Rastafarian community is not allowed an opportunity um, to sit on the board, etc., etc. I also do understand because in section 20, um, 27, disqualification of a member of a board, I understand it says very clearly that a member um, is disqualified if they are engaged directly or indirectly or has an actual contingent precautionary interest in a company, firm, or other entity that is regulated by the authority. And so a member of the Rastafarian community sitting on the board of the authority may provide a direct conflict of interest sitting on the board where you are now a member of the board you would be approving licenses and doing all those different functions whilst you may be engaged directly or indirectly and as you understand it i think most if not all members of the rastafarian community may have a direct or indirect um, um, interest in a company or firm especially if we're dealing with cannabis for example and so um I know my colleague may, may want to, um, my leader of government business, may want to, 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 to hop a little bit on my colleague, but perhaps it's an oversight on our part that we are very concerned and, and maybe we are um, saying that we think at some point that there needs to be maybe a greater involvement of them, but we also understand that there may be a direct conflict and, um, as to why they are not sitting on the board um, of the authority. Um, allow me to go further. There is something that is on my mind, I, and I stand corrected. I have not been able to see it. I don't know if my colleague can help me. But section, um, page 24 and section 41, where it speaks to requirement of a license. Now, I scan read, as I said, Madam President, I scan read through um, because of the time um, that I've gotten it, and I may have missed it. I don't know if it is there, so I'm, I'm going to pose it as a question. But sex requirement for a license 41. It says that a person shall not, on any premise which are used for the purpose of undertaking carried on by him or her, keep, use, or cause, permit to be kept or used, or deal with in any way a regulated substance. And it says here, here's where I'm coming to, unless he or she satisfies the prescribed requirements under this act or another enactment for the regulated substance and holds a valid license. So my question is, because I read through the entire license for regulated substance, the entire section, and you are applying for a license. But I could not find anywhere in this, and perhaps it will be in a subsequent legislation, what are the requirements for acquiring a license? What is it that I need to do to acquire a license? Is there a form? Do I need to have acres of these? Do I need that? Do I need that? What is it exactly that one needs to apply for a license? And um, I do not see it there. It speaks to the prescribed requirements, but I cannot find the prescribed requirements, Madam President. So I'm asking a question of the leader of government business. Is that um, an error, an oversight, or is it going to be a subsequent legislation um, 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 that is going to be proposed in reference to the license for the regulated substance. It's, it's, it's just a question that I am asking. I, yes. No, no. And then we go on perhaps to page 37 where it speaks to the fund, the establishment of a regulated substance fund. Now, it says that the purpose of the fund is to facilitate the operations of the Regulated Substance Authority. Um, maybe just one or two concerns that is popping up um, for us on this side, Madam President, is on the monies of the fund, Section 78. It says that um, the monies of the funds, Section 2, monies of the fund must be deposited to the credit of the fund in a financial institution approved by the minister responsible for finance. And then higher up on the section 78 1C, 
it says the monies of the fund will consist of, and it will consist of any fees charged under this act or another enactment relating to regulated substances. Um, Senator, and can we pause for a little while because we are approaching 6 p.m. and we need to have a Yes, yeah. Madam President, <coughs> I rise not to object in any way but to um, suspend, ask for the House of the Senate to suspend standing order 93 to allow the sitting to go on between the hours of 6 and 7, 6 and 7.30 in the evening. Senators, the question is that standing order 93 be suspended to enable the Senate to go beyond, to sit beyond the prescribed time of 6 or 7.30 in the afternoon. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Leave it granted. Please proceed, Senator Charles. Thank you very much, Madam President. You, you gave me time. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Okay, so, so my question is, and um, that is specifically because I've dealt with other matters with reference to um, the funding in my other capacity and the monies um, that would be acquired on the, the regulated substances. And so we know that when it comes to the banking sector, and um, the source of funds requirement, etc. It's going to be very challenging for the even the let's let's if we talk about the businesses, the business aspect, and the small businesses who may be given a license to operate and to grow a controlled substance or a regulated substance in this instance to bank their money. But if the authority, whilst I understand the authority will be getting money from parliament, they may be getting grants by the ministry, they may get um, um, monies from any levies, etc. But the fact that they will be getting money for fees charged under this act, it means that perhaps if I am in the business of a regulated substance, when I apply for a license, I will have to pay for that license. So the money, my, my business would be in, quote unquote, a regulated um, business. So I, I'm growing cannabis, for example, and I have a business, and so I am paying the authority that money. The authority has to declare its source of funds as to where the money is coming from. And my concern is whether the authority would be able to now bank the money that it is now going to charge the user for the license fee by virtue of the activity that that um, um, company or that user would be participating in. So this is something that I would like to to be addressed. We've had meetings um, with the Bankers Association um, to, to understand how this works and how it's going to work. They're trying to find their way around it. I know that th there's not been any probable solution to it because you're not able to bank money on the, because whilst we may decriminalize it here, um, within the banking sector and we, within outside of, 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 of our St. Lucia, it's not legal. It is still considered to be illegal. And so that is also a concern as to how the authority would be able to account or bank that particular, that particular money, <laughs> that particular money with reference um, to the fund. The second thing for me is on page 38, the board um, of, the, of the fund. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned because as I know it, Madam President, most boards, deal with the policy position and so they would also deal with the financing and the management of the fund etc of, of, of such an authority but we now have two boards that will be operating a board that will be operating for the management of the authority and then a separate board is being created for the management of the funds of the authority so it's one board there and one board there I'm not too sure why we're not allowing for the board of the authority to go ahead with the management of that fund and why do you need to have a separate board a second board just specifically to manage the fund and um, there may be um, a lot of crossover in terms of the responsibilities and the duties but the concern i have is if i understand it perhaps the the, the ceo of the authority would be the one preparing the budget etc of course with his finance team to present to the board for the operation 
of the authority and but you have the ceo who's going to be a member of the board managing the fund and i think there is a direct conflict there because the ceo could not be preparing the budget for his operations etc presenting it to a, a a body but he sits on that body and he's voting on the body for something that he's presenting to the body for approval so there is a direct conflict there madam president and i think it should be considered that the ceo should sit on the board but he should not have a vote he should be considered an ex officio member of the board where he presents he gives guidance there's clarification onto the budget the money etc etc but he should not be one participating and voting in the process of how the funds of the board are going to be used when it is he's the one who's presenting and putting that together so i think this really calls for some consideration and review that the ceo should not be sitting on the board but he should be considered an ex officio member of the board um i think madam president just verifying um yes these these are some of the concerns i think that i would like to raise with reference to the regulated um substance act the only thing i want to advise the government is that i mean i don't think we should be reinventing the wheel i know that we have mentioned that there are countries within the region who have enacted such legislation i am hoping that whilst we have done our consultations locally that we have looked at our sisters i know i saw um, perhaps um, a television um, um, story that showed the minister for commerce in st vincent and she did visit um, one of the farms in St. Vincent where they were growing cannabis, etc. I'm hoping that it's not only in visiting the farm, but perhaps ensuring that she can take a look at the legislation that they have, ensuring that maybe some of their experiences, some of the good, the bad, that we would learn from it and incorporate it into our own legislation because that's what we're there for. There's no need to come up and, and with something new. If it's already there and it exists, we can copy and learn from each other. And I'm hoping some of that um, has been done um, as well and I am also seeking clarification as well perhaps maybe not in this and in, in subsequent legislation but I know one of the things that as I've spoken to some of the people within who's eagerly awaiting the decriminalization slash legalization of the, of, of the industry is for the small farmers who are already quote unquote planting and what sort of protection is going to be there for them because there is the perception that whatever it is that happens is going to be for big industry and big farmer etc etc so those small farmers i think they are eagerly awaiting what is going to be put in place or what is already in place in terms of of, of protection for them and ensuring that they can benefit from the industry because as we rightly said the rastafarian community is fighting it's a movement but it consists of small individual persons within the movement and they're not fighting for one big person they're fighting fighting for the small individual um, people and so perhaps we need to let them know that there will be some measure of protection awaiting them to allow for them to be able to now become legal um, in terms of whatever it is they'll be doing within the industry so with those um, comments madam president i thank you very much Senator Joa here. Thank, thank you, Madam President, and good evening to my colleagues. Madam President, before I delve into this bill, I just want to beg leave of you uh, just for a minute. Earlier you spoke of my participation on the Advisory Council for CARICOM Impacts, and just to give members and those who are listening a bit more information on that. Um, St. Lucia's representatives are Dr. Stephen King, former chief medical officer and pathologist, and myself. Uh, my capacity is simply in the area of communications and someone who, you know, advocates generally against violence. And so we met in Barbados last week. And the purpose of this advisory committee is to really look at the economic impact of firearms. Uh, how you can track them and we learned greatly that even in sister island of Jamaica they have a, bal a ballistics department where they can map out uh, where guns are where gangs are and it was very interesting for me to come 
this afternoon and noticed that in one of our SIs we have an appointment of a ballistics expert. I think this is a great achievement for our government, it's a great achievement for the people that as we move forward in tackling crime, that we have these interventions that we are able to use, like the establishment and accreditation of the forensic lab. So our participation, the information will continue to come out of CARICOM Impacts, which is really an organization working on gun control and, 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 and the like in the Caribbean. So as the time progresses, we'll be able to give more information on that. Madam President, moving to the matter at hand. I thought you'd give the senators a little update on your attendance at the ICC at the caucus in okay. Washington. Okay, yes, I can also do that. I also represented as co-chair of St. Lucia's um, Conservation Caucus uh, in Washington, D.C. earlier in September. And my role was really to speak of how plastic pollution affects our waters, how plastic pollution affects our economy. And some of the highlights of my presentation um, on a panel with UN and UN environmental program is really to show that we are in support of a global plastics treaty. I was very surprised that, you know, we don't, we don't have a global plastics treaty as yet. But as we continue to see the warming of the environment, and how plastic continues to add to the disaster that we face, it was very important for governments to come together, heads of government to come together to understand that a global plastics treaty needs to be enacted. And what this will address is the full cycle of plastics. In St. Lucia, we've made tremendous strides um, as it relates to collaboration of the ministry, the Department of Sustainable Development, and also the OECS with the Replast Initiative. So in St. Lucia, we are able to collect the plastics, the plastic bottles. There are programs going on. Persons get incentivized for bringing the plastics. And the incentives take the form of points where they could use in the supermarket, the gas station. But the challenge is, after we collect the plastics, we either dispose of it at the landfill or we have to export the plastics. So the rest of the cycle of the plastic production of the process can be utilized. We don't have a plastic plant in St. Lucia. We don't have a recycling plant that focuses on that. And it was interesting to learn that even after we have a ban on single-use plastics, especially and even on styrofoam products, we, we still have a long way to go in terms of managing that. And so the challenge that we face is when we bundle the plastics together and we ship it out, we still add to the pollution because you have to pay for fuel of a ship and you have to pay for the transportation. And we know with global challenges post COVID-19, um, supply chain issues. I know that St. Lucia sometimes has to ship plastics to Trinidad or has to ship it to Honduras, but we don't use the full cycle of the plastics. And it was interesting, Madam President, if I might add, that when I attended the Taiwan St. Lucia Expo a few weeks ago, I was able to purchase a, a piece of handcrafted jewelry that was made out of a vinyl tape. And I was very intrigued by the fact that you know locals are still using that and yes it was an effort to support a small business but it really gave me you know hope and ideas that you know we can still figure out how we can make full use of the plastics here so our contribution was yes plastic pollution can affect us on a tourism standpoint because when tourists come to St. Lucia they don't want to see the waters muddied with with plastic it affects our food security because we consume fish and there are microplastics that we can consume as a result and so a lot of these things can have significant negative impacts on our overall GDP so my presentation as an advocate for sustainable development was simply in a nutshell on that um, Thank you, Madam, for that time to fully explain. Now, moving to the matter of the bill before us, I, I noted specifically that it did not speak of regulating cannabis. I noted that it was very broad, as members who have gone before me said, and spoke of regulated substances bill. And of course, cannabis will be included in that. Now, Madam President, I have to say 
that I do appreciate the comments made by the, or the suggestions made by the independent senator, and of course, the opposition members. Some of the comments, you know, I think are valid, some of which need some elucidation, and I will do my best to try to um, bring some light to some of these items. Uh, the first thing I wanted to note was, I thought this, this bill was very, very remarkable, because at first, in first part, it speaks of the regulated substance. In second part, it speaks of the, the establishment of the authority. It also speaks of the establishment of a tribunal to oversee the actions of an authority in the event someone brings up a concern. And yes, it does speak of a fund. So I will address just these few. When I look at where we came from, Madam President, and where we are now, I have to say, as someone who was always a supporter of the regulation of the industry, that I am particularly impressed that this SLP administration has been able to do so much in this industry in such a short space of time. I remember I was not even on the political scene as yet, and I interviewed Mr. Andrew De Keres, better known as Pancho, on a talk show that I had, an independent talk show. And he spoke of his advocacy and the legalization of marijuana. We did have some differences because I believe that it needs to be a regulated industry, and I will tell you why. Not so long after our conversation with Mr. Pancho, that was about 2018 going into 2019, I noted that the government, who at the time, engaged in a series of consultations. So it did not surprise me that this was also included on page 13, and that is section six, number one, where it speaks of a comprehensive public health education and training program to raise public awareness, especially for high-risk groups. We have to understand that the reason why we had to regulate cannabis or decriminalize a certain amount of cannabis is because it is still a drug. And so we have to raise this awareness, Madam President, to ensure that it is not used loosely, as the member opposite did speak of when she shared her concerns on that. But what the administration did, and that was before her time being appointed as a temporary senator, within the first 100 days, the Philip J. Pierre administration came in and regulated the use or the possession of up to 30 grams of marijuana. What this said was that persons of special interest groups, whether it be the Rastafarians, the boys on the block, whoever decided that they, it was their right to do so, the government acknowledged that it was their right to do so. But just as tobacco has its regulations and also has a stiff penalty, and I noticed the member raised that about a levy on cannabis, I wanted to just remind the, the opposition, the leader of opposition business, that it is still a drug. And so certain penalties will apply, certain levies will apply. And even the Prime Minister did speak of an increase of up to 50% of up to 50 on the duties for the importation of, um, of tobacco. And Madam President, this is really because where, whereas it is within your right to practice and consume and to do what you feel you need to do with your body, it is still not entirely legal. So in the first 100 days, the government decriminalized up to 30 grams of marijuana. The second intervention made by this administration was to expunge the records of persons who were convicted for the possession of that amount. Madam President, it was so important for us to do so because yes, the prisons are already filled. Yes, we are aware that a certain, that custody suites was broken down. We complain daily about the cost of maintaining inmates at the facility. A lot of these young men, ambitious as they would have been, would have been incarcerated for the possession of, let's say now, up to 30 grams of marijuana. The time it will take for them to be in the prison, the time it will take for them to have a hearing, and the amount of skills that they would have lost out on, the opportunities that they would have lost out on, Madam, it would have made it very challenging for them to be reintegrated into society, considering sometimes people are on remand for sometimes four or five years. 
for even a small possession. So I thought it was quite remarkable of this administration to ensure that we made those strides to give those young men, well, I say young men because it's mostly young men, to give them a second chance where they could go back into society and, you know, learn a skill, etc., and to allow for their records to be cleared and so they can now find gainful employment. Madam President, this, in my mind, marks our third intervention at getting a closer step to where we want to be. But there are so many challenges that face us, not just locally, but also internationally. Now, the Senator also spoke of, you know, us ensuring that we don't reinvent the wheel and I agree and that is why the mad, um, the Minister for Commerce did make those trips to learn from our partner um, of our, our sister countries what it is that they are doing and I just want to highlight two things that I also discovered in St. Vincent whilst they have regulated it to an extent there are still challenges that they face in terms of transacting and so the banks demanded or ensured that they needed to create a separate fund from the organization so that they can ensure that, that this is tracked now we know uh, when it comes to drugs there are certain things that could come to mind whether it be money laundering um, trafficking and so that in itself is a regulation that we had to follow this is why a separate fund had to be implemented now, in addition to that, the members, the one of the other, well, I think it was the independent senator brought about the concern of the minister setting the retail price of a regulated substance. And I think on the opposition side, they echoed those sentiments. Madam President, I do understand that in the global landscape, there are certain prices um, that most countries would abide by especially if you are importing a good. But this is an item that we will grow in St. Lucia. And I think it is up to us to determine what price we set that item at. Further, and just to strengthen um, or to provide elucidation to Senator Charles's question about you know, whether there would be consultation. None of this is new, Madam President. With every establishment of a board, with every instruction coming from a minister, it is not as if the minister wakes up first thing in the morning and decides that I'm going to provide some sort of regulation to cannabis. It is always coming from a place of consultation. In addition to that, Madam President, the independent senator spoke of the what he termed to be a draconian a draconian fine a draconian penalty and i had to go back to the to the bill and i want to bring members attention to page 45 um, which speaks of confidentiality and oath of secrecy or affirmation and madam president if you just beg me a minute i would just read it so we can understand what um what I'm trying to say and it's and part three says a member of the board secretary employee agent or advisor of the authority or a member of the tribunal and the recording secretary shall not disclose any information relating to business affairs applications um, and it goes on to part D which says the affairs of an applicant medical practitioner patient caregivers or other such persons that the member employee agent or advisor has acquired in the course of his or her duties or in the exercise of the authorities function under this act or any other law and it goes down to part five which says that a person who contravenes subsection three commits an offense and a shall compensate for any loss dam suffered or benefits received from the use of the information and b is liable on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding twenty five thousand dollars or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months so what was mentioned of the hundred thousand dollars does not apply fully to the entire bill and we have to understand that certain fines, and I am no judge, jury, executioner to determine what the fines are supposed to be, but the Attorney General under the advice of his office and other legislators would know 
what the, the conviction or what the fine should be for breach of confidentiality. Madam President, this is pe person's private information we are talking about, their medical information. And just as there would be fines for brief, breach of oath or breach of secrecy by a medical professional, it is simply stated here that this fine can apply if there is a certain breach of confidentiality. So in effect, it is not entirely quote-unquote draconian as the independent senator would have said because there are different fines that apply to different sections. Madam President, I wanted to make those brief interventions because I thought it was very important for us to understand these things. And what I want members, opposites, and you know, just anybody listening to understand is that most times when we make those recommendations and we make these laws, it is not because we believe that we have the cookie cutter idea of how it's supposed to be. There are always things that the government would be willing to accept and look over. But I think we have made tremendous strides with this bill, Madam President. I think this is a third intervention by the government to ensure that we get one step closer in terms of regulating what is going on. I appreciate the appointment of the various boards because I understand that the persons who are on the board of the substance of the Regulated Substances Act and the persons who are on the board of the fund are not entirely the same and these two serve, um, and these serve two different purposes. But yes, Madam President, as I have said and as I close, I want to extend my full support for this bill. I think it's remarkable that we have come in less than two and a half years to show St. Lucians that we continue to make strides in something that is so very important. Oh, and one more thing, Madam President. Um, the member opposite did speak of the, the addition of the Rastafarian community. And another member on his team spoke of it may be a potential conflict of interest. But I just wanted to remind the senators that this bill is not just specific to cannabis, that this bill speaks in wholesome of regulated substances. So Madam President, with this, I just want to say I fully support this bill. Senator Jean-Pierre Noel. Thank you, Madam President. My presentation is going to be very brief um, because I, I just want to add my voice to both uh, Senator, the independent Senator and Senator Nancy Charles um, with regard to their presentations. And I won't bother regurgitating all what they've said because it's lengthy. Just imagine if I had to repeat everything Nancy, had, Senator Nancy said and Senator Dill said, we'll be here, I guess, until 8 o'clock. But I wanted to, to mention, I wanted to touch on a um, couple of salient points that I don't think anybody has mentioned. On page 12, section 6, J4, it reads, to consult with the minister for setting the retail price of a regulated substance based on the market trends. And I'm not going to go, in, go into the broad, overarching um, nature of, of this because uh, m more than one person has already spoken about what the um, regulated substance is. But in this case, we take it to mean that we're speaking about cannabis. In a previous life, I did a lot of research on cannabis. And I know that there are many, many, many strains of, of cannabis. There are many strains. There are strains for euphoria, strains for insomnia, strains for pain control, strains for this and that and the other. I am concerned as to how this is going to be regulated in terms of price, because this is what I infer from this section to consult with the minister setting the retail price. Now, backing up on that, on the price, I also watch a lot of documentaries. And one of the documentaries that I watched was one about Murder Mountain in California. Um, and basically, it was talking about how with so many regulations, levies and taxes, that the OG farmers, the, o the original ganja farmers, were kept out of the industry. Or that the, the, the taxes and the, and the regulations were so onerous that they could not compete. And so, what you found happening that was that there was an increase in the number of OG farmers who went underground and the black market 
became more lucrative for them. As a result of this, the reason why the place is called Murder Mountain is because the number of murders that were committed there any time the regulators went in to try to control and to see what was happening in that area. So that is my concern, that the OG farmers are going to be pushed out of an industry that they themselves pioneered and have fought so hard for that they're going to be pushed out. And any time a group of people feel pushed and that their backs are against the wall, we know what happens. So I am very concerned about, about this, and I'm also very concerned, as the independent senator said, about the scope of the committee. I mean, we're talking about, on one hand, cannabis, and another extreme, we could be talking about coke, coke crack, anything. We could be talking about, you know, it, it, the, 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 it's so vast what we could be talking about. So I am very concerned about this, and I would like to see it more controlled. If we're talking about cannabis, we're talking about cannabis, and let's deal with that. Because otherwise, what you're going to have is various committees dealing with all of those different aspects, and you're going to have chaos, chaos in other words. You're going to have overlapping of, of, of um, concerns. And, and it's going to be very confusing for the people. And wherever there is confusion, there is mayhem, there is chaos, and I'm concerned about that. This is the sum total of my contribution this evening on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Leader of government business. Thank you, Madam President. This, this bill. This amendment has been a very interesting one in terms of the, discuss, the discussion, the angles that were taken, and while I listened to my colleagues, I, I couldn't help but reflect on a number of things that have happened both in the discussion, before the discussion, and um, outside of our country. So I think, unlike what transpired earlier today, I think this bill brought about a, a different level of discourse, which I think I'm very happy to, to see. I think all parties contributed. Um, nobody agreed with everything everybody said, but there was a level of maturity and um, quality in terms of the level of discourse, which I think is where we would like to see this honorable, or the Senate, um, move in. So I want to thank all, all our colleagues for stepping up a little bit later um, and and i think the controlled substance thing may have inspired some of us to exercise some more control madam president there were a few however there were a few comments that i noted that perhaps um, were adequately uh, addressed by my colleague senator so it would make my task a little bit less arduous um, the issue of religious use and the involvement of the Rastafarian community as the strongest advocates is correct. And I just want to remind the Senate that we have at all times uh, made sure that they are part of the discussion and the decision making. As far as their involvement on boards and so on, I think um, Senator Charles has adequately addressed it, so it would have satisfied the curiosity and concern of her colleague, which I think was um, quite, aptly done, <coughs> quite aptly done. Um, Madam President, the issue about what happens with regulated substances that not, not necessarily um, would be cannabis, this is why the language of the bill, and, and again I'm no lawyer, speaks to legislative, legislated substances. Because we know that there is more than one substance, quote unquote, that in this country as we try to work with cannabis that we will have to regulate. So we are not just being very myopic and looking at cannabis in a vacuum. Um, we would know that our people have experimented with many other substances. There, some of them, they have their scientific names and some of them have their street names. Black Joint, um, I don't know some of them. We have had issues with COPD and there are other things that um, are happening in our 
communities and in our country. That, mean, that means that we must not just be looking at cannabis and, the, and even to suggest that we are discriminating, um, but there are other substances. And I did mention one about what's happening in schools now with these students that we need to pay attention to. So I think there is a reason why the language is specific. Now, it was very interesting with the these issues that were raised by the independent senator, and I must say I scratched my head a little bit when I was following his, his argument. Um, he made reference to a number of sections in the bill that he had issues with, and I followed through with some of his, his um, observations um, with regard to the waiving of licenses that he mentioned on page 7, page 15, 7, 1. Um, I'm not sure he's, he, was, he was saying that um, is, is a, a person um, having the authority. I'm not sure whether it is a person or from what is, is in the, re the, the document that it's the licensing authority that's re that is regulating the licenses. So I think in, in front of me what I look at there is it's the actual licensing authority and not an individual. Um, so I think that that was, that was noted. Um, we, on, on page 18, the composition of the board, um, I think that was raised. Um, I, I would like to think that that can change because this is new territory that we're entering. This legislation um, and this process is not something that as a country we have gone in before. So there will always be those types of issues that, that will be raised. And the, by the time we get to the bill itself, I think some of the some of the decisions that will be made thereafter will have to be informed by what we do now. And so um, the, the concern he raised about the composition of the board, um, I think he mentioned that there was nobody on the board that could have dealt with a particular issue. Um, I am thinking that that composition can be changed um, to deal with the other regulated substances. Because some of the people on the, on the, on the current board may not have the expertise um, that are required if other substances have to be regulated. So that will be done um, to, according to what substance is being regulated. Um, yes, there will be need for us to clean up some of what is in the legislation. And we have never been a government that takes the posture that when we come to this parliament with something that needs fixing, that we, it's, it's absolute and we, we should not touch it. I think we welcome, especially from um, learned persons, the Bar Association, and other entities and stakeholders who have insight and who can provide the guidance that we will take that into consideration. The issue of the Rastafarian community, um, I think I mentioned that. There's also a question that was raised, I think that was raised by one of the opposition senators about how are we going to ensure that the small farmers benefit and they are not excluded from the process. Um, it is not by accident that the Ministry of Commerce is also the ministry responsible for cooperatives. And one of the solutions to getting our fishers, farmers, and other small groups of progressive or enterprise, enterprises to benefit is by organizing them. It is not going to be easy for farmers to benefit from any industry, whether it's cannabis, fishing, farming, um, CMOS, or any other industry or small business enterprise, if they are on their own, doing their own thing. So it is very important that we ensure that these smaller groups, particularly, as she correctly said, from rural areas who don't have a lot of capacity, who don't have the need, the, the, the wherewithal to manage their own finances well, that small cooperatives are put in place to help them um, strengthen their capacity and therefore they can use that to be able to access funds, to be able to manage and, and build on, on the industry. So I think the Ministry of Commerce, which is also um, the Ministry of, um, also the same department where we find cooperatives, is well placed to have a seamless transition, a seamless um, connection between these two groups. So I'm very hopeful that that can be done. Um, Madam President, I think we can say that we have made quite a few strides. This piece of legislation is, like I said, entering new territory. And 
we will not shy away and say that we cannot address the issues before us. Advice that was given included men, um, looking at what mistakes our neighbors have made, and I agree and I take that well, because like was cited in other jurisdictions like Jamaica and even St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, there may have been lessons learned because some persons may have moved into this thing um, not knowing some of the implications of the decisions. But we are not first, we are not last, we are somewhere there. So we have the benefit of the hindsight of some of these colleagues that we talk to and we have the opportunity to learn and not make the same mistakes. I want to assure the opposition that our Minister for Commerce, when she went to visit these countries where those industries have been ex explored, did not just go to visit the farms. She also um, was able to go to the labs. She was also um, exposed to some of the practices and some of the processes involved in managing um, the industry. And also the, the, the legislation, the legislative framework that is being used, we have to and are able to access some, one of the countries that shall remain unnamed was not very willing to share it with us, but one of them was quite willing. So we can look at their legislative framework. We can look at the processes they use, and we can go through it and say, well, you know what? This, they did this and it was, was a flop. Or this is working well, so we believe that it is more adaptable to our St. Lucia. Don't forget that um, we are, in terms of our population, our strategic location in the region, we, we have a lot of opportunity um, that we can, we can use. So this is one of the reasons why in my earlier presentation when I presented the, the bill, um, I did indicate that we are being very cautious, meticulous, and strategic because we understand the sensitivity of this and I think all parties here have agreed that as we proceed, we must proceed with the greatest level of caution. There is no need for us to rush anything. We don't think that we feel under pressure. I think the, the various stakeholders, especially the Rastafarian community, I think they're very happy with the progress we're making. They've been very patient with us. And, and you can see by the level of participation, I think there were two of their members in the lower house um, during the sitting. They have given the, the government and the various stakeholders a lot of support. I have every reason to believe that they understand the needs, the need for us to take our time, so that by the time we go into this in, in, full, in full, that we would have made the right decisions. So I want to thank all of them for having been patient and working with us. I want to thank all the stakeholders that I listed that have participated in the process. And before we return to this uh, Senate and this Parliament with um, the actual cannabis bill, I think what has happened in this House and in the lower House would have told us that there is quite a lot of work yet to be done. And we are open and willing to do that. So I look forward to that happening and that by the time we come back, whether the Minister of Commerce gives us an update or we are ready to, with the bill, that we would have been much better off than we are when we started with the process. I thank members again and Madam President, I look forward to this uh, movement and this, um, um, these amendments and these bills um, serving the purpose for which they were intended. I thank you. Senators, the question is that the regulated substances bill be read a second time. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a contrary opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. An act to establish the regulated substance authority Regulated, regulated Substances Tribunal, Regulated Substances Fund, to provide for the licensing of regulated substances and for related matters. Clause 2, interpretation. Clause 2 stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 3, act binds the crown. Clause 3 stands part of the bill. Aye. 
clause one, part one, clauses four to 40, regulated substances authority. Uh, Madam President, I wish to draw your attention to the page 14 clause in this regular, this clause six one. Um, we need to insert a new paragraph Q, and that means the other letters will have to be um, renumbered. And so what we'll have is by inserting paragraph Q, which um, I will read, the insertion would read, that's the new paragraph Q, it will read to conduct okay. research. Yeah, page 14, yes, page 14. 14. Yeah, page 14. Yeah, page 14. You have them. Clause 6 1, functions them. of the authority. So that new paragraph Q would read to conduct research, develop policies, and have stakeholder consultations on substances as the board directs. And so what that means is that the former Q now becomes R, mm -hmm. and the former R now becomes S. And therefore, the former, the, the, new, um, the new Q will read, um, no, P, let's start with P. P will read, prepare and submit to the minister an annual audit report. So now we have inserted Q. So the new um, R would read, do all things as the board cons considers necessary or expedient. Okay, let me read Q because it's what we inserted. So let, let's just take it from P to R. P, Q, R, and S, yes? Okay, so with the insertion of Q, the new paragraph, if we take it from P, it will therefore read as follows. P, prepare and submit to the minister an audit, an annual audit report. Q will read, to conduct research, develop policies, and have stakeholder consultations on substances as the board directs. R would read, do all things as the board considers necessary or expedient for the purpose of carrying out its functions. And S, which was not initially in the previous one, now it's an addition. S, by letter, because the content is the same, S would read, perform other functions under this act or another enactment. Thank you, Senator. And these amendments were made at the House level. House yes, they were at the lower house. Yes. So they are not new amendments from us. Yes. Part 1, clauses 4 to 40, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 2, clauses 41 to 63, license for regulated substances. Part 2, clauses 41 to 63, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 3, clauses 64 to 75, regulated substances tribunal. Part 3, clauses 64 to 75, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 5, clauses 76 to 83, regulated substances fund. Part 4, clauses 76 to 83, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 5, clauses 84 to 89, enforcement. Part 5, clauses 84 to 89, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part 6, clauses 90 to 93, miscellaneous. Clause, part 6, clauses 90 to 93, stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause 1, short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Aye. Senators, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put the question, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Senators, I beg to report that the regulated substances bill went through committee stage without amendments. Leader of government business. Madam President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and that the bill be read a third time and passed. 
Senators, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the regulated substances bill be read a third time and passed. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of the contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Be it enacted by the King's Most Excellent Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This Act may be cited as the Regulated Substances Act 2023. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Madam President, I move that the Senate do stand adjourned. Sine D. Senators, before I pose the question, I would like to thank you very much for going through the entire uh, order for the day. I know some of you were under weather, but you stuck to it, you stuck to your guns, and you stayed in and ensured that everything went smoothly again. I thank the new Senator, um, Laura Jean-Pierre-Noel. It was good having you and those who have been back. So once again, thank you so much. Senators, the question is that the House do stand Adjourn sine D. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Sitting adjourned. Have a pleasant evening, All Senators. Right. Hello again, viewers. We have now come to the conclusion of today's Senate hearings when the House, the Senate, um, convened or reconvened after the suspension. There was a motion. We saw one motion being passed and a couple of bills being passed. The motion being tabled, the motion which was tabled earlier this afternoon, authorized the Minister of Finance to borrow just about 1.2 US million dollars loan from the CARICOM Development Fund, and that was to finance the Passius Community Water Supply Project. That loan will be pay repayable in 10 years in 40 equal uh, installments. Much later on, there was a lot of discussion on several bills that were presented by the Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, um, Honorable the Leader of Government Business, Honorable Gibeon Ferdinand. Um, some of the bills included a Code of Civil Procedure, Invest in Lucian Amendments, Civil Aviation, and the Regulated Substance Bill. The Regulated Substance Bill was the one which generated a lot of discussion. This bill in particular um, spoke of the um, legislation to regulate um, substances uh, regulated substances. It also establishes um, a statutory board. Some of the provisions include the establishment of a statutory board, um, which will also provide for licensing. It establishes a tribunal um, to deal with matters of grievances, etc. And it also establishes a fund. There was a lot, lot, lots of discussion on it. Um, um, worthy of note was the independent senator who, who brought up um, um, certain, um, certain several concerns. Several concerns. Um, we spoke about the fact that there was no mention of cannabis in the legislation to which the honorable um, leader of government business has said because it is not, it won't be restricted to just cannabis, it was purposefully um, it was purposely not uh, stipulated that the, the, the mention of cannabis be in the legislation. <coughs> he also spoke about, he had some concerns that the minister would be the one who would determine that what, what can be considered a regulated substance. And also he felt that the board should be independent. He also spoke about um, 
the wide jurisdiction of the board. And in his summation, the leader of government business also spoke to, um, gave some clarity on, on, the, on the legislation. Um, Mr. Ferdinand, he, Honorable Ferdinand, he noted that um, he spoke on, on the fact that um, small farmers, which was a concern that was raised by the opposition, the fact that small farmers may be excluded from the whole process of, of, of commercialization of the, of the cannabis industry. And he, and he, he, he gave the assurance that um, because this whole industry falls also under the Ministry of Commerce, that um, the small farmers would be well directed and guided. He also proposed, for instance, that the need for the small farmers to enter cooperatives. Um, he said that the ministry would be well placed to support the, the farmers. Um, concerns on the opposition side concerning the inclusion of the Rastafari community, that too was, um, was, um, was addressed. And um, the honorable member, he did did it say that the Rastafarian community was actually quite pleased with the progress that the government had made? He, he made it known that yes, you know, it was new territory that they were entering and that they were not opposed to suggestions. He said that they would be learning from other jurisdictions in the Caribbean, those that had passed similar legislation. Mm -hmm. But on and all, he said, you know, this was an, an issue that the government was prepared to take on head on and that given what is happening globally, St. Lucia would not be left out, but they would tackle the whole question of, of um, regulated substances and the decriminalization or legalization of cannabis as the world is going. Mark? Um, c'est un concernant c'est changer la même et aussi à ce face à l'opposition. Je suis bien content que um, pourtant en face le sénateur Nancy Charles parle comme, comme concern ni il dit il était opposé il pas il pas dit il casse pas c'est pièce 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 mais après en chaitant il commence à comprendre avec um, il il, il supporte ça et aussi concernant qui se se rasta c'est yo qui a change um, débat ça la catchen concerne ça tout le c'est yo qui a toujours demandé pour ça et que demandé pour m'a metté ce 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 rasta rasta et bien constitue rasta en dedans um, c'était un bon petit en journée c'est pas normal nous qu'a ni um, ça n'est qu'a qu'a duré autant temps um, uh, ici à mais uh, la bonne discussion est avec uh, nous qu'a quoi tout le monde um, est bien content et puis m'a n'est passé eh bien, um, vous dites, je suis bien content pour assister ici et tout, avec un nom, l'instant, c'est travailleur, c'est technicien, avec ce travail du ASN, nous avons dit merci un peu pour rester pour nous et que nous avons pris l'occasion pour mener un vieux, un vieux, vieux mener un pour, pour continuer à rester pour MTN pour tout l'instant programme du soir avec ce même.